right, everybody, welcome to Theory Underground. I'm your host, David McCarricker, and today we are joined by the one, the only, Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal, author of many books I hope he will talk about in his own personal introduction here on the channel. And uh, we will both do kinds of introductions, but really today is about the introduction or the announcement, the unveiling of an upcoming course called What is Sex? Welcome, Cadell. How are you doing? Oh, you couldn't hear me, could you, Cadell? <laughs> well, the people on the side of, uh, of the live stream were able to hear me, and I just introduced you. I said you're the one, the only, the author oh, of many books okay. that I hope you will talk about when, as I introduce you. Yeah, I forgot to unmute on the side of... Zoom. I don't normally mute on Zoom, which is why that created a confusion. So welcome to the stream. Welcome to the channel. All right. Are we live? We are. We are live. <laughs> okay. All right. Fantastic. Great to be here. It, it, uh, it almost didn't work out. <laughs> I, I've been in a sort of fugue state for the last couple of weeks, recovering from a, a medical emergency and time has been weird. And I thought that this was going to be later. And you're like, are we on? I was like, yes, yeah, we're on. <laughs> we better get this going. <laughs> so it looks like we've got a lot welcome. of people we're here, here in the here. chat. So welcome, folks. Cadell, I was wondering if you could just take a moment to introduce yourself to talk about the books that you've been working on, to talk about Philosophy Portal and what you've been doing with that. And then I'll say a few things of, of introduction for the folks, I'm sure, who are joining from your side of things who would, might not be familiar with me or my work. And then we will talk about The Unveiling of What is Sex by Olenka Zupanchik. Absolutely. So yeah, well, um, yeah, great to be here. Great to be on Theory Underground again. For those who don't know me, uh, my name's Cadell Last. Um, I'm the creator of Philosophy Portal. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Philosophy Portal, you can either visit my YouTube channel or just uh, type in philosophyportal.online and you'll sort of find out the background about what's been going on there. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a, tra a trained academic in the sciences who fell down a Zizekian rabbit hole back in 2014 and had been exploring that rabbit hole ever since and and really looking for ways to one might say you know approach contemporary problems in science and philosophy uh through taking that Zizekian lens seriously and and not just the Zizekian lens but also um the entire Slovenian school and the many ecological offshoots of that school um I really do feel like there's a interesting community of thought emerging around this school and um just happy to play my part uh, in terms of developing the theory and teaching the theory as best as I can. And, and um, you know, uh, and the reason being that I think that they approach questions of sexuality, they approach questions of economy and politics, which uh, desperately need new thought. Um, and uh, I suppose, you know, our focus on what is sex is a, a good example of of um that whole initiative and that whole uh motivation wonderful yeah and uh you you've written a couple of books you want to say something about your oh book? sure 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 yeah so uh okay so my books i the the biggest one is or the one you know not just the biggest but the one that has consumed the most of my life energy um is global brain singularity so Global brain and all of these books can be found on philosophyportal.online. So Global Brain Singularity and explicitly, you know, following Isabel Millar, you know, both of us published our PhD thesis through publishers who charge an exorbitant amount of money for access to those theses. So, you know, following her footsteps, I've also done the same thing. If you actually want a virtual copy of that thesis, just email me. And I'm free, I'm cool with giving away a free virtual copy of that book because the Publishers charge an arm and a leg. So Global Brain Singularity uh, basically was a culmination of about five or six years of research. Um, it was the foundation for my PhD thesis. And basically it was trying to combine 
evolutionary theory, specifically uh, human evolutionary theory, with futurist speculations. And I think that this is increasingly an interesting topic. You know, I, I really want to bring out global brain singularity more and more because um, I do think that it approaches interesting ideas that are more and more relevant at the intersection of, you know, our evolution as a species, reconciling ourselves with the evolution of our species, you know, that comes out of a Darwinian tradition, um, and reconciling ourselves with a quite novel qualitatively new horizon of technology, which a lot of people find disorienting. One sort of elevator pitch summary of global brain singularity could be along the lines of trying to think the intersection between our, you know, our, our primal evolutionary drives and instincts and the emergence of a very different environment than an environment that any humans have existed in before. Um, and it's like a collision between two worlds there. You could say like that's a mega contradiction of our identity that's that's more and more um i think problematizing our identity and creating disorientation um you know and and you know to reference elenka zupancic a little bit you know she has a chapter in what is sex called object disoriented ontology um and and i think that that's kind of like where a lot of people are feeling disoriented you know it's it's at this it's at this collision point um and the reason why i titled it global brain singularity was because this involves the entire planet, the, the network of the entire planet. And it's kind of a singular arrow of time trajectory. It's like the whole planet's heading towards this te technological singularity and we need new universal thought to approach that. And the more I was in my PhD thesis researching about this, the more I realized we need to go deeper into philosophy. We need to go deeper into psychoanalysis. And that's one of the reasons why I fell into the Zizekian hole was like, okay, I'm going to take this seriously and I'm going to really see if I can connect these two worlds of thought. So that's Global Brain Singularity. Um, I also uh, co-wrote a trialogue uh, called Sex, Masculinity, and God with two guys, uh, Kevin Oros and Daniel Dick. My attempt there was to hold a type of um, dialectical space of conversation um, to circle around those topics you know, sex, masculinity, and God. And specifically with Kevin and Daniel, the interesting window there is that you get three self-identified men around the same age um, in the becoming of their identity and three very different identities. I'm an academic. Kevin is more of a tantric guy and uh, Daniel's more of a Buddhist guy. So you get three different types of, of male identities and um, we just have basically a very open, natural, friendly conversation about those topics. And I think that it really functions both as a therapeutic and as an intellectual conversation starter around those ideas. Um, I've often heard people say to me about that book that it's a great uh, conversation starter if you have a, a men's circle or a um, uh, some sort of... Um, community space where you would like to facilitate conversations around those topics. Um, so I, that, that's another book. Um, and I've also just released a book called Systems and Subjects, which is a book I wrote during my postdoc at the Bertha Landfree Center for System Science. And my goal there was basically to combine interdisciplinary science or systemic science with continental philosophy and trying to generate a conversation at the at the level of a, a feedback loop between systems and subjects. Um, that on the one hand, you can have a, a view which goes towards a total systemic perspective. And on the other hand, you can have a view which goes to a more subjectivist, perhaps solipsistic perspective. And I think what we need is a conversation about the dialectics between systems and subjects. So that's 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 that book. And I, I basically I'm kind of crazy in that book, I think, you know, I'm, it's very it's very speculative. And, and I'm just basically I was in kind of like the abyss of post academic life. And I was like, mm. I'm just going to write what I think, you know, I'm just going to go for it. And uh, this is what I want to write. And, you know, it's Good. a cool book, but Good. it's also very crazy. <laughs> that's that's where you get these short circuits, right? These yes. these interventions into these various fields that have maintained a sort of seclusion from the world and from everything that matters, you know, and that's the What is Sex book is in a series called Short Circuits that introduces that idea of these, these books that are meant to create short circuits in these discourses. 
And it sounds like that's what you're doing. But I also want to say just a couple things about you and, and why I want to collaborate with you and why we're doing this together. Um, I see Cadell Last as a sort of inspiration and mentor um, in, as far as like the organizational business side of things goes because he is further along the path than me. Um, I do believe the Theory Underground is the only thing in existence doing what it's doing in some ways, but there's a lot of overlap with what you're doing. And at the level of, I think, how, how you first caught my attention in terms of respect was realizing, oh, you don't fuck around. You're going to the best, hardest, most profound books in the history of modern philosophy. And so I know you taught a whole course on Thus Spoke Zarathustra. I know you taught a whole course on the phenomenology of spirit. And now, right now, you're teaching a whole course on the science of logic. And then this uh, July, on July 15th, you're launching Jacques Lacan's Ecree. And you're the only person who will be on the internet um, who's taught a whole course on the Ecree that I'm aware of. And I mean, that book is a bastard of a book. And so, you know, I couldn't be, I couldn't be more excited about the work that you're doing and to be in dialogue with you. Um, but as far as introducing myself to everybody, what's up, everybody? I'm Dave, but uh, I used to be called Theory Plebe on this channel. The channel had a name change and a complete brand change, and I've been kind of switching from being what I, I was maybe like five to four to three years ago, which was more of like an influencer that thought, okay, you know, people are getting into radical politics and what they need is theory, to changing to, well, whether you're an activist or an academic or or whatever, the chances are you've already got a lot of resources at your disposal for this kind of stuff that I had originally thought was important. And I think more important than anything like I had originally thought uh, was needed is a space for working class intellectuals, especially of the blue collar variety who are trying to develop themselves with their earbuds while working at Amazon. Yeah, you're wearing a blue collar right now. <laughs> And uh, we both have a basis in, in, in kind of the labor fields before we went into academia and, you know, uh, uh, families in the working class and stuff like that. And we both, you know, have uh, our own experiences with disillusionment regarding the established um, institutions. And that's actually you joined the first course at Theory Underground, The Idea of the University, where we read Carl Jasper's book from cover to cover, The Idea of the University. And uh, really, it's a positive critique of the actually existing institutions from the level of the idea. What is the idea, the standard we should be reaching towards, and how do we critique the university with that? But the, the, the other courses that we've been offering this year are the Professional Managerial Class Consciousness and Ideology course, which is also very closely related to the idea of the university because the PMC as a class or as a sort of subclass of the working class that mediates between the ruling class and the, the rank and file workers is a relatively new phenomenon that comes into existence after Karl Marx has, has already died. And so it's, it's the, the idea of the PMC as something that is fleshed out from a variety of perspectives from left to right to radical, independent thinkers who are um, challenging traditional class theories um, comes really from the, idea, from, from the phenomenon of progressivism at the turn of the 20th century, the 19th century into the 20th century with the development of Taylorism and the de-skilling of the working class and the monopolization of skills into college-educated elites who are supposed to have a lot more in common with the ruling class than with the rank and file workers beneath them. And so this idea of what we see a lot of today, this sort of technocratic elitism that scorns people who don't read, who scorns people who might not have the same habits or diets or other kinds of, as Catherine Liu would say, virtue hoarding as we do, is something that is relevant and important for working through if there is to ever be some kind of a mass scale um, restructuring of society that would take advantage of and harness automation, right? And so that's important to my work because my first book, Waypoint, is subtitled Time Energy, Critical Media Theory, and Social Change. And basically, time energy is the concept I developed in my master's thesis. And 
it's something that comes out of really working through being in time and Das Kapital, right? Working through Heidegger and Marx. And it's the time energy is the existential precondition of labor power, which gets presupposed and obviously, uh, I mean, our entire lives become standing reserve for labor power and that the schooling system as it currently exists is usually just qualifying our labor power abilities so that we can be um, either workers or managers. And so it all kind of fits together and how it all fits together is obviously developing. Right now though, uh, Michael Downs, who's another blue collar warehouse worker who's been studying philosophy for 20 years, he's teaching uh, Slavoj Zizek's For They Know Not What They Do. And we're just a couple weeks into that course couple of lectures. You're in that course as well. And so there's a lot of overlap and sort of opportunities for synergy between our organizations because we're both interested in Slavoj Žižek. And Slavoj Žižek would not be who he is without Alenka Zupančić. And I don't even know, as, as the sort of plebe in this dynamic, who's really here to learn from you more than anything else uh, and to help other people learn from you, um, can you tell me if I'm even saying her name correctly? Alenka, yeah, I've I've been told that the the Zupan is like the the ch of a of church, like C H of church. So Zupan, I think, is the correct pronunciation. But you know, like I've been listening to um, Michael Downs' lectures on uh, "For They Know Not What They Do," and I I think that the you know the <laughs> we we can let's let's forgive let's forgive each other if we bastardize the names yes. of a few people but we'll strive to uh, improve the focus here i think the the focus here has has to be on on the the underground theory and this is this is uh one of the things that like you know to me the respect and the admiration goes both ways because um i really inspired by what you're doing as well and i feel like both of us are sort of pioneers in a certain digital intellectual space and um, one of the things I've tried to do, especially after my doctorate, is to really embed my intellect in a network or a collaborative way. Like, so, for example, with the Sex, Masculinity, God book, it's sort of a collaborative. And I'm trying here, like also with Theory Underground, and I see that ethos in you, what you do with the young Zizekians, um as a a network intellect. Um, and I'm just, you know, I, I see that as, as also a, a huge inspiration for myself, but yes, I think I agree with you that Alenka Zupancic, uh, in terms of her work, um, is absolutely essential to, to Zizek's work. I think that it's remarkable to see, um, how her theories, um, have extended and expanded Slavoj's in, in interesting ways. Um, if you study the genesis of her career, um, of course, um, she studied under Zizek, um, but has really differentiated and become um, a remarkable theorist in her own right. I think it's a fantastic example of what can happen when you train under a master and differentiate at the same time, because even though her works are relatively short compared to, say, Zizek's, like a big you know, a big uh, tomb, like less than nothing or something She's like that. Concise. Yeah. She packs, she packs just an enormous punch. Um, she is so theoretically precise. She is so theoretically sharp. She's an absolute master of dialectical thought. And it's, it's just, um, it's, it's a real, she's a real treasure. She's a real treasure. And I, and I hope, that, that we can, um, in opening up conversations around these dense abstractions, these, uh, you know, intense, these intensities of thought that, that we get in the Slovenian school, I think opening up conversations between the two of us um, and with those in the course um, is going to be um, just, uh, like I said about the work you guys are doing, I think good for the culture. Thank you. Thank you for all that. And I just want to say to everybody in the live chat, I think we've got a pretty good live uh, audience going right now. And I just wanted to say um, thank you for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. But also I want people to know who are just dropping in right now. One of the reasons I do this on YouTube and not Twitch or anywhere else is because while it's live, you are able to go back to the beginning and then, then set the speed setting 
faster so you can actually catch up with the live recording without having missed anything. And so just wanted to encourage people to do that as you're still arriving. So today, the order of business is to essentially sell you all, not all, to sell some of you on the idea that what is sex is a book worth reading and it might be worth taking with us because we're going to be teaching a course that begins, I mean, it kind of begins now because this will obviously be embedded in the actual structure of the course if you sign up for it. So people joining in the future, you will be watching this as well. Um, but we will also be doing an introduction to go up uh, next week, a week from today, I think at the same time, um, which will just be a conversation on the actual introduction of what is sex. But uh, And then when the course actually launches, then this will all be the private side. This will be the stuff for only for the people who've signed up. Um, the, the course begins um, the first Sunday in May, I believe, right? Is that, is that right? Is it May 7th? May 7th, we got four intensive sessions, May and June. Four intensive, yeah, and they're, each is yeah. two weeks apart, which means that you have two weeks to read a short chapter that is theoretically concise but dense and uh, profound. So you really want to read it, write a little reflection, and then reread it so you can go over your reflection again and fine-tune it before you post that up. In, in the case of Theory Underground, in the forum where that would go. And so, Cadell, you have a sort of presentation prepared, don't you? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna, I mean, I, I can show that, I can show that one slide, which is that the basis slide. of our, what we wanna have the basis of the conversation around, right? Do you um, want to just- Yeah, abs abs absolutely. Um, I can share my screen if you just open screen sharing and then I can I can share that. Actually, um, because it's good. I think if we get if we get like a a visual overview of what we want to talk about. Is is that already a slide I have that you sent me in an email? Because I could just put it on the screen and then you don't have to worry about. Um, oh, I think screen. I'd have to send you the. P did I send you the PDF? Yeah, I think yeah, I, I did. Think so so it's. But it's I can like I can either one, either one. Yeah, we'll do that because I would be easier, I think, on the side of the stream and dealing with OBS sure. and everything like that. But yeah, so um, today, so, 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 so I can, basically, yeah, go ahead. It's about, no, I can, I, I, I can open, I can open, let me open up a little bit about, um, Alenka's yeah. work and, and then we're going to get into three reasons why we think what is sex is worth diving into. And we're not going to necessarily discuss the core of the text yet. That's going to be for next week. Actually, we're going to discuss the introduction. So look out for that. We're going to have a huge uh, little presentation and, uh, um, and also sort of uh, you'll get a vibe for what the course is going to be like next week. But this is really just to riff on some really important philosophical background, underlying reasons why we think this is an interesting topic, underlying reasons why we think this is worth an enormous amount of time, energy, dedication and thought. Um, but first, like, let me just go into a little bit about Alenka's background, because she's written several books. So she's written Ethics of the Real. She's written Shortest Shadow. She's written Why Psychoanalysis. She's written The Odd One In and Let Them Rot. Now, it's hard to find a thread in her work that pulls it all together outside of a general philosophical interest in Lacan's return to Freud. In, in my view, is like that's sort of what is the rift that she's navigating, is that Lacan presents himself as an anti-philosopher in his work. At the same time, it's obvious that Lacan has a tremendous respect for great philosophers. He's always bringing in names from philosophy. He's bringing in Heidegger. He's bringing in Hegel. He's bringing in, you know, Plato, and he's reading, you know, the great works, and, you know, he's read Spinoza, you know, he's well read, he's extraordinarily well read. And at the same time, it's interesting that a lot of great philosophical work, I think, especially after Hegel, come from people who proclaim themselves to be anti philosophers. Um, it's kind of like an interesting paradox, I think, in the in the field. Um, in any case, Alenka is clearly Ha focused on something which is very primary, which is Lacan's return to Freud and its philosophical implications, right? Like for Alenka, 
philosophers who treat psychoanalysis as a marginal, partial discipline, which does not have universal relevance, is a huge mistake. For Alenka, the psychoanalytic moment of the 20th century in particular is something which has universal relevance and not just to, let's say, general subjectivity, but also to philosophy as such. Um, and that's one of the things we're going to be getting into and focusing on is one of the reasons why we should read What is Sex is because Alenka is in some sense demonstrating in her very work um, why why psychoanalysis has a tremendous relevance to the history of philosophy conceptually um, and that actually what we're looking at with bringing sexuality into psychoanalysis is a fundamental battleground of thought which i actually believe is 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 um at the very foundation of what people call the culture wars at the very foundation of um our difficulty in thinking politics, economics, um, modern global society. Um, so in doing like an intensive deep dive into what is sex, deep dive into what is sex, what I really want to do and with Dave is open up a new conversation space, open up a higher order conversation space. Like online, it's very easy to find spaces where people are exploiting and manipulating sexual difference. It's very easy to find online spaces where people are creating simple binaries between men and women. We're masculinists, we're feminists. We're going to argue from the masculine side. We're going to argue from the feminist side. It's very easy to see people creating businesses and exploit and podcasts, exploiting sexual difference. What I hope Dave and I can achieve in taking seriously a link as what is sex is raising the bar for the type of conversations that we want to have about sexuality and what's at stake. Uh, I don't know if you caught this, Dave, but I think what is at stake is the very ground of the culture wars, the very ground of thinking economics, politics, society, family. Right. Like if we don't right. think and, and that and a link and here just to summer, I'll throw it back to you now. But like what ties a career together for me is, again, taking Lacan's return to Freud. Of universal philosophical interest. That philosophers who think psychoanalysis is just a particular marginal discipline, which does not have universal consequences for the idea or for ideas as such that Alenka is saying this is a mistake and also psychoanalysts who think that the clinic is the Holy grail and that we don't need to engage in philosophy anymore. She also thinks that's a mistake. So on the one hand, you have philosophers uninterested in psychoanalysis. On the other hand, you have psychoanalysis uninterested in philosophy and Alenka really operates that bridge where we have the clinic and the symposium, right? Like we have, we have the, the analytic clinic, we have the couch, and we have the symposium, the party, you know, and, and we've got to have that, that higher order conversation. Because right now, I hope we can talk about this a little bit later, but right now when it comes to sexual difference and sexual division, I think we've got a lot of pigs and partiers who are, um, or on the other hand, I think um, extremist totalitarians who are exploiting and not not capable of raising the bar of the conversation. I yeah, I, I thank you for reiterating it. Yeah, I definitely I I was following, but um I, I think it's worth driving that home because that is my point of entry for sure. In the early days of Theory Play, one of the first books that I really went in depth into was Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, which I took to be, you know, a very relevant text. I took it to be sort of canonical on the topic. And in a sort of sense, it is obviously a, a, a fundamental part of the discourse. But um, my identification at the time was as non-binary and genderqueer, right? I was uh, one, of, one of Jordan Peterson's feared uh, neo-Marxist feminist, you know, uh, radicals or whatever. And, and my my... My reading of psychoanalysis has definitely complicated things beyond then, you know, in a lot of ways. And, and I think that there is a serious disavowal 
of fundamental contradictions that are still like, as you say, um, exploited as like a way of life for a lot of people um, in the influencer sphere, in academia, in the PMC. And so the, <laughs> and I, there's a, you know, we definitely, as people who work in philosophy, first of all, men are overrepresented, right? Um, and, and men uh-huh. have unique problems, right? And yeah. the, uh, philosophy being overrepresented by males is also a sort of, it creates its own problems. And obviously there's a lot of people who prey on those problems, who prey on those insecurities, who prey on those, those questions. And so, yeah, I like, I like that you're really putting this up front. The goal really is to raise the level of the discourse and the, the, the quality of thinking and conversation that we'll be able to have about this with ourselves and with one another. Yes. And I mean, just a side note, I mean, obviously I think that over time, more and more women will get involved in everything like that. But we're not in some like identity politics way, like out there trying to find and recruit people on that basis alone. I think that part of the answer, part of the solution to such a thing in philosophy is to really uphold the women who are killing it, who are absolutely like making a mark in history and not just, uh, and the theory underground theory underground is a triple entendre theory plea went underground first. Second of all, we're doing something like a scene, like in the, in the underground scene, not to be counterculture for counterculture's sake or for consumerism's sake or for the aesthetics of transgression. That's not the point at all, but because for various reasons, we all have good reasons to not see a future in the existing institutions. That's the point. But then the third uh, level of the entendre is the London underground, the rail system in London. And the, the lines of thought idea is like there's four essential tracks to, to the theory underground setup. And you can actually see four tracks represented on the screen right now if you're watching this on the side from YouTube or in the class in the future. And j- just to be brief, these really are introduction to philosophy, whether that be at the deep end or at the super beginner end. We hope to have both represented because different learning styles. Some want to have baby steps and other people want to be thrown in the deep end. So introduction to philosophy, um, political and social theory, and women philosophers and special cultural topics. Like those are three separate lines. And then the fourth line, which is really the first line, I just saved it for last because it's the best, is the good life. And the good life is where we have conversations about, you know, what is the purpose of education? What, is, what are the problems with education? What is, what is family? What is love? What is friendship? How do we live with technology? What is, what is digital literacy and critical media theory in the 21st century? That's all under the good life. And this text, to bring it back around to what is sex, is a crossover between the good life and the women philosopher lines because it really serves both purposes. And so that's why we have to have it front and center in the unveiling of courses this year at Theory Underground. Yeah, a lot there and a, uh, you know, a lot there that that I really resonate with. Um, and Alain Kazupontich is an interesting figure in this conversation because in, in my experience teaching philosophy, when I teach a Hegel course, it's basically 100% men. When I taught a course on Freudian psychoanalysis, it's closer to 50-50, men and women. And I, not that I'm like saying, mm. oh, because I'm teaching Hegel, it's all, all men that that's, uh, we need to get more women represented. It's just interesting observation that when I teach Hegel, it's 100% men. When I taught Freudian unconscious, it was about, it was closer to 50-50. And the interesting thing there is, that psychoanalysis does bring in explicitly intellectually the idea of sexual difference. And I think that considering that as an intellectual idea is something which opens a higher order conversation, which um, seems to naturally include more identities, seems to naturally include more more humans. And I think that that is a a philosophical interest, you know, like, I do think we should avoid the, let's call it the woke temptation of just including identities or representing identities, because we're reifying those identities. 
I don't think that's the the way, you know, like I think the way, you know, when I was growing up um, as an intellectual, one of my heroes, uh, legitimate heroes was Jane Goodall because I was originally focused on chimpanzees. I was originally focused in um, human evolution. And I actually was inspired to go to Africa to study great apes. And I did for two summers because of Jane Goodall. But it's not because Jane Goodall was a woman. Right. That's not the right. reason why she inspired me. I wasn't right. inspired. Oh, Jane Goodall's a woman. I'm so inspired. No, I was inspired by Jane Goodall because she's a universal subject. So when right. I say that, when I say that um, we're trying to raise the bar of the conversation on, on, on sexuality, to me, what that means means is raising it to the level of the sexual division as such, where mm. we're no longer exploiting the division, where we're no longer saying like, and like, and here, like I'm speaking from experience. I'm not against people doing women's work. I'm not against people doing men's work, but I'm against people who use that identity to create the enem opposite enemy. Yeah. Like I don't, I'm not for men's work where you're blaming women or I'm not for women's work where you're blaming men. No. This is about learning about the division in oneself and, mm. and, 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 and through that process, no matter what you were born, raising the level to universal subjectivity. That's, Wonderful. and I hope that's what we can do. Wonderful. Right. And the particular, the particular informs the universal. Exactly. That's why. And that's why sexuality is so philosophically important. That's why the Freudian moment is of relevance to, to philosophy, because if you pay attention to the particularity of what Freud said was if aliens came to planet Earth, the first thing they would note about the human species is that they are sexuated. Like we take for we take as a, a priori given. We take it as an a priori for granted that we reproduce sexually. Not all beings reproduce sexually. Some beings reproduce asexually, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So the fact that we're sexuated is itself a given. It's something given to our species and which not only do we have to live with that like many other animals do, but we cognize it. We reflect on it. We have to reflectively carry our sexuation and pass it on into the next generation. And, and I think that's the whole reason for psychoanalysis is this conflict between ego instincts and sex instincts. That's what Freud said. You know, that basically, you know, the, if you read the studies in hysteria of the original Freud papers, you know, he's basically dealing with hysterical women who are struggling with the burden of this conflict between the right. ego and the, like women who want to throw their babies out the window. They didn't want to have the kid. Right. right. Like it. And, and, and that, you know, now, now, like it's a much different socio, it's a much different sociological situation now because we have the pill, you know, we have many open available contraceptions. Many people are like, we have a culture where we're exploring sexuality, totally mm -hmm. disconnected from reproduction. Mm -hmm. Right. So psychoanalysis was emerging in the place where, it's almost like the cult that culture was emerging, but right. it wasn't yet what it is now. Right. Right. And it's not because like, before, because before, like in the traditional culture, like you're keeping the baby, you're right. having the baby, you're married, you know, you know, it's not, this is not a question. <laughs> it's not a choice. Right. Right. And it's not gotten easier. It's not gotten easier for women or for men. It's only gotten more difficult, especially seeing as our fundamental vulnerabilities and this contradiction are being preyed upon it's not gotten easier to deal with it it's not gotten it's 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 a lot easier to to think about a bad relationship you had through this sort of uh this this binary frame that's being uh reified through the culture war right so your personal experiences that were sucky all, are all of a sudden being preyed upon by people who have this desire to inculcate in uh, the population a specific targeted marketing demographic, right? And so now you're being targeted by ads and by influencers who have this. So I, yeah, 100%. And so is there anything else that we want to say as far as introduction or general kind of stuff goes before we get into these three things? Because I, I have it ready to put on the screen for the folks on the video side. Yeah, I mean, I think I think 
yeah, let's 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 just get into the three questions. Let's get into the three questions. All right, everybody. So let me see. Let me know if you can see this okay. I think you should all be able to just see this just fine. Here we go. Yep, it's visible. We're in business. Why? What is sex? There are three basic sort of statements or answers to this question. Do you want me to read the first one here, Cadell? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Go. Uh, just you. Uh, go. Go. You can read it. First, sex slash things in themselves. In parentheses, continental philosophy from Kant to Heidegger, fail to theorize sexuality in scientific technological universe. Second, should I go on to the second, or do should we just? Well, let's 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 approach them one by one because I want yeah. let's let's un, let's unpack that. So right, you know what what does that mean? You know, sex and the things in themselves is like. Let, let's start with like what is what does it mean the things in themselves and why why connect that with with sexuality so like at the grounds of modern philosophy really like when we think about modern philosophy what a lot of people mean when they say that is basically a series of thinkers but the mega thinker is Kant there are other important thinkers that constitute modern philosophy but Kant represents a, a fundamental break. There's, of course, David Hume. There's, of course, John Locke. There's, of course, uh, a Renner going back. With Kant and the idea... You, uh, you broke up on that last uh, sentence. You said, of course, there's a... What? There's other thinkers that are important, like, for example, David Hume, like, okay. for example, John Locke, like, for example, Rene Descartes, if we go back to, like, the first gesture of modern philosophy... But Rene Descartes, sorry, but Immanuel Kant represents a fundamental break for many in the, in modern philosophy, um, because of what he wrote about, but also because of the time he was writing around the time of the French Revolution and the emergence of the modern political state. That's also an important dimension to it. Am I coming through clearly? Yeah, I'm hearing you now. Um, if okay, there there seems to have been a stream issue that made it so people got kicked out and they came back and. If, if it occurs again, we might take a short intermission, right, to get some water okay. and stuff while I fix the bit rate because it's giving me a recommendation. But let's keep going for now. All right. Well, so like back to the point about the things in themselves. What Kant is basically doing there is making a move and a break from uh, pre-modern notions of objectivity. Right. Pre-modern notions of objectivity basically had for Kant a naive relationship to the thing or a naive relation to the object because they wouldn't they weren't considering the relation with subjectivity. And really Kant goes into the nature of subjectivity and he goes into the nature of the subjective a priori and he's interested in the transcendental correlation. So like the basic foundation of modern philosophy as at least the idealist tradition deals with it is this idea of the subjective a priori and the transcendental correlation and these dimensions of philosophy um, are preserved in the work of Hegel. They're preserved in the work of Schopenhauer. They're preserved in the, preserved in the work of Nietzsche. They're preserved in the work of uh, Deleuze, even like and Deleuze works with it even further. So that's really this fundamental break. However, um, when it comes to Lacan, when it comes to psychoanalysis when it comes to Elenka Zupancic's work, is that what they always emphasize is that the philosopher um, presents themselves to us in their work and present themselves in their ideas as non-sexual, as asexual beings. And here the idea, and so like this is running through, so when I say Kant to Heidegger, I'm not specifically picking on those guys. I'm not, right, right, right. I'm just, I'm, it's just to articulate this lineage. It, it's a catch all because it catches, it catches Husserl and Hegel as well. It catches, exactly. It catches Feuerbach as well. It catches Marx exactly. as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's just saying that when we think about fundamental reality, our relation to fundamental reality, 
oftentimes it's investigated without the a priori that we are sexual beings. Whenever you bring in sexuality, whenever you bring in libido, this is seen as your particularizing philosophy, your anthropomorph your anthropomorphizing philosophy, your 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 injecting um pathological substance into into divine cognition of concepts. And so Lacan always plays with this. He's always mm. trying to show the way in which the unconscious, which is not stupid, the unconscious is intelligent, the unconscious thinks and speaks, that the unconscious is also expressing itself in the work of modern philosophy, is also expressing itself in the work of pre-modern theology, is expressing itself in poetry, like Freud mm. would say. Like, I've never been somewhere which ha has not already been visited by a poet, right? Like, what Freud's saying is, is that he's discovering in the unconscious intellectual materials which are expressed by artists, mm -hmm. naturally. Like, the artist is the artist because they have excavated, so to speak, the unconscious. They are expressing what so many of right. us feel but cannot say and cannot articulate so well. Right. So when we're thinking about sex and the things in themselves, when we're thinking about this in the context of continental philosophy, analytic philosophy as well, in the modern scientific technological universe, like what did I describe as my, my thesis, Global Brain Singularity? It's like, we've got the primitive human drives and we've got the modern technological universe colliding in a contradiction. And the place of psychoanalysis is here essential because psychoanalysis is realizing that in this very collision, something of intellectual significance is being expressed by the unconscious. I love so that, that would be like yeah, my opening no, a, framing. I don't know what that, that, that I have other things I could mention, but I'll, I'll see what you feel about this. Well said. Well, and I was just, I was going to bring in the fact, you know, Nietzsche says that, you know, every philosopher, when they think that they're doing pure philosophy the most, you know, they're writing an autobiography, right? Um, to paraphrase it, but the, it's every, you know, Kant, his critique of pure, of, uh, his critique of pure reason, it's auto, it's autobiographical in the sense that so much is being shown about oneself and one's, uh, the subject of enunciation, right? That is missing uh, from what's being actually said. And, uh, and so as far as wanting to be critical thinkers, critical readers, critical of ourselves, critical of others, not just in the sense of polemics, not just in the sense of creating enemies or destroying them, but in the sense of gaining distance from the sorts of ruts and habits that we're ingrained in, you know, the patterns of thought. In terms of living the examined life, we have to think this way. And so Nietzsche obviously is a is one of the, he's kind of one of the proto um, psychoanalyst. Yeah. An analysts. And I, I mean, I say proto in the sense that, you know, Freud tried not to read Nietzsche because he didn't want to be too influenced by Nietzsche. Exactly. But then I forget who makes this point that of obviously if Freud is avoiding Nietzsche because he doesn't want to be too influenced by Nietzsche, then he already has a sense of Nietzsche that's more than he's letting on. And, you know, this is, you know, you can't read the genealogy of morals or, or, or beyond good and evil without these, these key quotations or like these moments where he's playing off of the imagery of like a cellar of, of, of wild dogs that is locked beneath the home of, of your suburbanite dwelling a uh, bourgeois person. And the, the point is that seller of dogs is it, we all have these, these instincts. And of course we will get into the fact that instinct and drive are not the same thing. We can get into it later because obviously yeah. Lacan expands on what Nietzsche and Freud are kind of first in line to, to see and to try to articulate. And so Nietzsche and Freud both articulate it in their own ways. But the point is, is yeah. that we're not these noble little, you know, uh, beautiful souls that come out of the womb and that if we could just be let to do what we do, then we'd all create <laughs> harmonious societies like Rousseau thought, right? Like the utopian right. socialists thought, like the hippies thought, you know, no, we, yeah. we're, we, we're, we're uh, give, give a three-year-old child, give a two-year-old child, give a one-year-old child the muscle capacity 
uh, of, of a horse and it would kill everyone in the village. Right. It would, <laughs> it would. And, and, and thankfully they're dependent for a long time on, on the care of others. And, and that's something unique to us that Lacan is profoundly focused on is the fact that we don't just come into existence as adults, which is something that you get if you just read philosophers. Right. We, and I love that there's a chapter in this book, what is sex that is called, I think it's like what, how, how adults where, are made. Where do adults come from? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, it's a nice inversion. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I just love this. And, and, and thinking about sex as things in themselves, we, 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 you know, a lot of the people on my side have gone through my, mine and Mikey's conversations for Lacan 101 and Zizek 101. And so they're probably already thinking about the Bohemian knot. They're probably already thinking about the fact that we have the reality of things as they appear in images and in perceptions, which would be called the imaginary for Lacan. And then we have the way that those make sense, the way that those are ordered, which would be the symbolic. And then the real is what cannot be integrated into that. It's what refuses that. And to, in a sense, that's what we are trying to appro approach here is what is the real? And I understand there is also a problem. We can get into it later. There's a problem with conflating the real and the things in themselves. There's a problem with complete, con conflating yes. Kant's noumenal with the things in themselves, or, or with, I mean, sorry, with yes. the, uh, with, with the real, but. Look, yeah, we, I mean, we have to, we have to also be open to the evolution of the idea of the things in themselves. Like, so for example, I'm teaching the science of logic right now. And the way Hegel, um, Hegel does try to reinvent the things themselves in a in a in a non-Kantian way, but I mean that's a big that that that's a big conversation. Um, I just want to I just want to um, work a little bit towards the a crucial point you were making about about Nietzsche and and Freud about you know bringing instincts into philosophy, which I think is really important. Is that so? Like as sort of prep work for for this um, for this conversation with you, I took my PDF copy of Being and Time. And I searched through the entire book for the word sex. And it doesn't appear once in the text. Now, what does Alenka mean when she emphasizes that um, philosophy here can be in some sense um, enhanced or improved or deepened by engaging psychoanalysis is, for example, in psychoanalysis, the place of sex is often also the place of absence. It's the place of the non-relation. And so it's interesting that in Heidegger, being in the world, Dasein, sex is absent. Like literally sex is absent, but psychoanalysis says also sex is absent. So like right. to me, like this is, a, this is an example where like when you teach being in time, like this is an interesting thing to think throughout the right. reading. Like it's not right. it's not a deconstruction. It's no. it's it's when you read being in time, how does sex function in its absence? For example, like does that produce a new reading? Right. Right. And you know, I, I always I always like to touch on the fact that Levinas says that uh Dasein never eats soup and and then uh Irgure says that uh, Dasein doesn't breathe air. And Arendt, in a less polemic way, in a less explicit way, essentially says, Dasein never thought natality, which Dasein for Heidegger is always being towards death. But what about the coming into existence of new being and intergenerational you know, passing things on and, 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 uh, the hope of the child, the hope of the future, the whole, you know, these things are just completely absent there. And so, but what, what I, what I like to also say just for, especially for those who are new, who may have, who might have not caught me saying this before, but you know, it's, it's, it's Marx and Heidegger and Levinas are fundamental for me. Like Lacan and Zizek and Baudrillard are super important. And I, and I've been developing my understanding of them because, Time energy theory is lacking without a theory of libidinal economy. And so my entire project has been on hold for a few years as I develop my understanding of the most sophisticated, most cutting edge theories of subjectivity and, and libido or libidinal um, economy that currently exists, right? And so, uh, but, but 
Nevertheless, for me, it, Das Kapital and being in time really do form like the two things that it's like they're both failed projects in a sort of sense. Mm -hmm. They both they both are able to make us see things that we will not be able to see without them. They both mm -hmm. help us understand why almost everything in existence is wrong. Almost everything, every worldview salesman and 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 uh, uh, idea hustler is is selling us some bullshit. Like they they really do do a profound deconstruction of our most fundamental modern bourgeois uh, assumptions, presuppositional frameworks, and. And they and they're not getting at nothing. They they do definitely get at real things that without passing through those, you're not in the conversation. You're not in the you're not. I'm sorry. You want to be a working class intellectual? You still have to pass through that. It's not like we're gonna lower the standard because we want to have people like me who work at Amazon being represented. Um, in, in no no no, we're not gonna lower it. We're going to say we're actually raising it higher. We're raising the standard higher than where it is in academia today, which is to say in sociology departments, in social science departments, in economics departments, everyone has read cliff notes on capital, doesn't think they have to read it. Everybody's read cliff notes on being in time as they study Derrida and Merleau-Ponty and Sartre and all of these others, but they don't think that they have to read it. They go, oh, well, we could just read Levinas because, you know, he was a Jew who was persecuted and he denounces Heidegger. And so we can just kind of skip the Heidegger step and go straight to Levinas. No, Levinas is essential for a critique of both Das Kapital and being in time, of both Marx and of Heidegger. But a critique of them is not the same thing as a, as a, as a disavowal, as a downplaying and dismissing. It's not the same thing at all. And so what I see Lacan doing as someone who passed through Heidegger, who was mm -hmm. profoundly influenced by Heidegger and who was in dialogue mm -hmm. with people like Sartre, who was in dialogue with people like Merleau-Ponty, is he's going, okay, yeah, Merleau-Ponty, you might be keen on the fact that childhood development is essential and something that totally gets missed in this project because Merleau-Ponty was keen on that. But from Lacan's standpoint, he's looking at the situation. He's like, yeah, but you're still not even really thinking about how deep this childhood development thing factors in. And so anyway, that's my def sort of... Uh, <laughs> My, my justification of reading these guys, because I do think that like there's two fundamental projects and then everything else is sort of expansion, pro expansion packs that completely reconceive those projects. Oh, I, 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 lo I love, I know I, I love your, your, the, the perspective on like your, I think we all have our ontologies, you know, like we all have, we, you know, we all have our ontologies and, and we all make our own way through philosophy and we all try to combine different thinkers and I, I i love i love the idea of the project of you know and that's really dialectical is like you're not not identifying with marx not identifying with heidegger but let's throw them together and let's see in the working through of these thinkers what we can what we can bring out but like i just want to quote kendrick lamar for a second when he says at the end of his control verse what is competition i'm trying to raise the bar high who trying to jump and get it and I think that that's like what theory underground and like what you're expressing there. And what I hope I try to do also with philosophy portal is basically saying, what is competition? We're trying to raise the bar high. Who's going to try and jump and get it. And like, that's that. And that's what we want to do with raising the discourse is we don't want to stay in Nietzsche in terms rabbling around. Um, and, 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 and we, we want to, we, I mean, st striving in the abyss, you know, we're striving in the abyss and that's, that's, that's hopefully what we can do. Um, I just want to say say a little bit um, uh, more on this idea of philosophy at the intersection of psychoanalysis. There's this fantastic video because uh, on first encounter with this, you might say, for example, are we going against what is oftentimes too um, generically lumped in as deconstructionists? Are we going against these figures? Um and so what I did in also preparation for this is I looked up one of my favorite videos on YouTube, which is a short video by uh, interviewing with Derrida. Um, it's titled, if you want to look it up, and we can put this in the chat, um, it's titled On the Private Lives of Philosophers. Um, and it's an interview with Derrida where he's asked if he could sit down with Heidegger or if he could sit down with Hegel, what would he ask them? What would he want them to talk about? And he said, here's his answer. I would want them to talk about their sex and love lives. Why didn't they, or why did they refuse to write about it? Their sex lives. I would like to hear them speak about their sex lives. 
What is the sexual life of Hegel or Heidegger? Because it's something they don't talk about. I'd love to hear about something they refuse to speak about. Why do these philosophers present themselves asexually in their work? Why have they erased their private life from their work? End quote. So that's Derrida asking this question, which I think is very much in the spirit of this book, which I think is very much in the spirit of this conversation is at the intersection of philosophy and psychoanalysis, there is this rift and there is this question of the intellect and sexuality. And what Zupanchich will say in the introduction of her book is that we are not debasing philosophy by introducing sexuality. By introducing sexuality, we are raising it to a surprising intellectual topic, meaning we're not debasing philosophy, we're raising sexuality to an intellectual topic. <laughs> and I think that's, that's so true. I've added the link for the private lives of philosophers to the... Um, it's a great video. It's a great little clip. It's in the description yeah. of this video now. So people will be able there's to... Funny, it. There's funny screenshots you can make of that video where Derrida says, uh, I'm not talking about making a porno with Hegel. And you could just screenshot that out of context and just say, I'm not... I'm not I don't want to... Uh, <laughs> This is, people do keep saying, put this on, put this on, uh, you, you need to have Theory Underground on, on OnlyFans. You got, you got it. I'm just yeah. it, Well, it's a joke. But people, have, <laughs> people have suggested it, but it is a joke, I think. I think it's a joke. Anyway, so um, right. I, I, I want to get uh, some more coffee in a moment. So you tell me when it's a good time for me to step away because I'll, be I'll be able to hear you as I go. But should we read from the second point? Is this a good time? Well, to I, I actually, I, I would, I, I actually have a few more concluding remarks to make about oh. this point. So, if you want to get coffee, I can make okay. those points, and then, and then, and then we'll go to the next point. Let's All go. right. So, so basically, what we tried to say so far is basically that with this idea of sexuality and the things in themselves, from Kant to Heidegger, what we're basically saying is, is that there's this interesting intersection where. We want philosophical thought to raise the bar and raise sexuality to a surprising intellectual topic. Um, and there is precedence for this. So let me just uh, share a, a quote by Freud on Schopenhauer. Freud was a, a, a fan of Schopenhauer. Freud read Schopenhauer very deeply. Of course, Schopenhauer influenced Nietzsche a lot. Um, and here's what he had to say in his Three Essays on Sexuality. Schopenhauer showed mankind the extent to which their activities are determined by sexual impulses in the ordinary sense of the word. It should surely have been impossible for a whole world of readers to banish such a startling piece of information so completely from their minds, end quote. And what, what Freud's trying to say there is like, look, Here's a great philosopher, Schopenhauer. He's basically done a good job of demonstrating that our motivations, that our impulses are fundamentally sexual. They're libidinal. And if you don't take that seriously, if you don't take that seriously intellectually, then you're missing the entire, you're missing the theory of motivation. You're missing the theory of why we move, you know? And, and, and the more I've read continental philosophy, I mean, if you're missing the why we move, you know, what moves us, uh, you're, you're missing a bit, you're missing a big part of the picture, you know, like um, Slavoj Zizek's Less Than Nothing was going, was a, a possible alternative title for that uh, book was Eper Si Muave, which means, and yet it moves. So we've got to, you know, yeah, so that's one philosophical reason to take it seriously. Um, another point Freud made about the concept of sexuality as it regards to philosophy is here quoting Freud, he said, and as far as stretching the concept of sexuality, which has been necessitated by the analysis of children and what are called perverts, anyone who looks down with contempt upon psychoanalysis from a superior vantage point should remember how closely the enlarged sexuality of psychoanalysis coincides with the eros of the divine Plato, end quote. So what Freud's trying to say there is, look, when you say sex in common sense terms, you're, th you're talking about something very narrowly and you have a lot of preconceptions about what you think sexuality means. But actually, when we've done psychoanalysis, the concept of sexuality has become so enriched and so enlarged 
that it starts to look a lot like what Plato was talking about in the symposium. So not only is this a philosophical topic, but it's even the ground of philosophy. Because if you're talking about Plato, you're talking about the the, the footnote upon which philosophy was written. You know, philosophy is but the footnote upon, written on Plato. And Plato is certainly taking Eros seriously. So that's that's one connection. Then I'll make a second connection here is if you look through Thus Spoke Zarathustra, there are some key points in Thus Spoke Zarathustra where Zarathustra talks about sex explicitly. Um, and he's just bringing it into his philosophy. And so I think that there are precedents in both Sch in, in Schopenhauer, in Freud, in Nietzsche to take sexuality seriously. Um, if there are people who are particularly interested in the passages in Thus Spoke Zarathustra that I would point towards, the most interesting one is called um, On the Three Evils. If you look up On the Three Evils, um, Nietzsche has this crazy dream. Or Zarathustra has this crazy dream where he uh, weighs the world by three things, sex, the lust to rule, and selfishness. And he has remarkable things to say about sexuality. Um, one of my favorites is, uh, here I'll quote just a short, one of my favorite things he said. He says, sex, but I want fences around my thoughts and around my words too, so the pigs and the partiers do not break into my garden. So what he's saying there is that, yes, like on in another sense, he's saying like we should celebrate sex. We shouldn't see sex as something that we just moralize against. But I also want fences. I also want defenses around sex so that it's just not open to pigs and partiers. So he's saying, yes, we can't just moralize sex, but we also can't just be uh, sex positive. We can't just be, you right. know, and so forth. So. Anyway, so I'll end this, there. I'll end there. That that ties in really nicely to this piece that will be published soon to the Dangerous Maybe blog by Michael Downs. It will be called Psychoanalysis, Schizoanalysis, and Marxism, or, or, or Marxism, Psychoanalysis, and Schizoanalysis. I might have the order wrong, but you get the title. And the it's a it's a short book being published to his blog, really. And the the it, there is a significant portion of it that is a critique of Deleuze and Guattari because, you know, as much as we owe an intellectual debt to them for so many things and, and as much as we respect them as being profound and difficult and, and worth reading, um, we're Lacanians and there are some serious problems with the, the heritage passed on from D&G. And really bringing it back to this idea of not wanting the partiers and the pigs to wreck your garden, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a key quotation in this piece coming from Mikey that is, the machinic unconscious is a rapist. It has no ethics. It just is bodies touching bodies and there's no do or do not. There are no fences. There are no safeguards. And in a world without safeguards, in the hippie, everybody's on acid, everybody touches everybody, and it's all just, we have no inhibitions, there is no castration, there is no prohibition, there is no no from the name of the Father. There is all just, it's all, everything's everything, everywhere all at once, right? No. 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 Is, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. It's wrong. Absolutely. It's not, this is, this is, this is a great theory of how geological rock formations and stars uh, develop and come in and out of being. Like they're really good at that kind of metaphysics, but they're very bad at human subjectivity and what it means to be a human and why we don't want you just walking up and sticking your hand in my mouth or, or ass or whatever. You know, they're, they're, we need fences. I've sense. seen some, in, you know, it's interesting in the theory gram meme community. I just want to say something quick in the theory gram meme community. You get an insight into the ethics of Deleuze. And so like here, like, you know, playing the devil's advocate a little bit with Deleuze and Guattari is you see an insight into what their project leads towards, which is I've seen memes that say uh, become like mushroom. Right. Or become or become amoeba. Like they basically want to become animal like um, in a way that's like pre human. Right. Um, in a way that's like before subjectivity. It's like right. before we had the burden of the law, 
before we had the burden of the no, before we had the burden of uh, of 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 uh, cognizing sexuality. I mean, yeah. the the people who like to say these things and share these memes, there are a significant portion of them who call themselves post-humanist and they think that, yeah, it, it, I love when Catherine Liu makes fun of it, when she she's, she talks about how these Delusians at these conferences for the last like 40 years have been saying shit like, we need to become like bumblebees and shit. And she, she, she just says it like offhandedly laughing about it when she's in conversation with Chris Catrone at a platypus panel. And she's a base queen. Her, her, she, she really has no respect for a lot of the stuff that you and I love that a lot that you and I see a lot of value in. But I think that she, she hystericizes a continental philosophy and theory because of how it can serve the PMC to stay in its own little self superior bubble of jargon that never really actually tries to engage with the world. And from her standpoint as a sort of old left person, it's just like, yeah, but the working class still has to work. And so your little bubble of jargon and privilege and distance from material reality is sustained by the blood, sweat, and tears of the people that you scorn as ignorant, as lower than you, as lesser than you. So she really brings it back to reality. But you know, I just I love I love that she she just mocks this idea of the post human because yeah well we're losing our sense for what it means to be human we're losing our ability to freely create ourselves we're losing our all of these things sure but you know n nevertheless we persist there is value in this stuff and we hope that we can unpack it so uh, but that's a whole other thing I just want to say I love Catherine and I and I hope to talk to her soon on the channel about the PMC but she does go on channels with people like, uh, say, Daniel Tut, and she will just be like, but what's the point? But what's the fucking point of Deleuze Guattari? And I just love it because I don't think that there's not a point, but I don't think that we should be on public platforms talking about these things if we're not ready to to say, okay, well, here is the point. Let me tell you. And that's what we're doing right now with What is Sex? We're, we're here to tell you the three major points of this text. We're not going to just assume that you're in the elite who understands that this is an instant classic that you must pass through. No, we're going to unpack it. So let's get to set the number two. Number yeah. two is uh, deontologized epistemology. Okay. Deontologized yeah. epistemology. Gender constructivism very loosely or not connected at all to ontological real of sexuality. And then in parentheses, you say Foucault and Butler. Or if to Butler. Foucault to Butler. Right. I mean, I so like, again, um, I mean, on the one hand, like, it shots fired, and on the other hand, it's not shots. Like you know, it, it it it's 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 we like, it's not like um, the like in some sense engaging with these people as a negation is at the same time a respect, because like think about all of the people we're not saying. Like we're basically saying, like for figures like Foucault and Judith Butler, like specifically like books like The History of Sexuality and Gender Trouble, these are citation classics. These are books that have set the tone um, for philosophical culture. They have set the tone for philosophical theory. And so in some sense, it's a, it's a sign of respect to, to um, engage with certain thinkers, even if it is in a, a negative gesture. And, and even if it's in a negative gesture, of course, what we're trying to do here is bring a significant degree of nuance. And I would like to, to right. bring us a different degree of nuance because it's not just saying, it's not just saying, oh, the, this bad, this good. Right. It's not like that. So right. um, let's say here first, like when it guards to I'm going to break it down into the pop idea and the serious theoretical idea of oh, of of this point. OK, so the pop idea is basically what our culture has become in relationship to gender is this idea that we can construct our own gender. We can construct our own identity. Um, that society in the past has imposed gender categories on us. So, for example, when you're born as a baby, you'll be wrapped in blue. When you're born as a girl, you'll be wrapped in in pink. And and all of these a priori categories will get put onto us. And that we inherit this from a patriarchal, uh, monotheistic civilization, which uh, reified gender categories. And now we can free ourselves from the big other 
of social normative expectations, and we can um, treat our sexual identities as the ground of liberation, where we can liberate ourselves, we can pick this identity, we can pick that identity, um, and, and we, can, we can remove ourselves from the constraints, we can remove ourselves from the limitations of the historical categories. That's basically what I mean here by the idea of a gender construction, which is uh, not connected to ontology, and right. the question of ontology. Now, as it regards to the way Alenka Zupancic engages with this theory in what is sex, I mean, give, now this is like the serious, more theoretical engagement with this pop idea. So, the, there's two ways she deals with specifically Judith Butler on the on the topic of uh, gender um, on the top on the topic of gender trouble, um, her book yeah. Gender Trouble, and and the idea of the central idea of gender as performance. So, gen so the, the positive side of Judith Butler for Zupancic is that Butler's performativity and emphasis on performativity basically is something along the lines of we create our essence. So yes. our essence, so like our masculine and feminine essence, whatever you want to say is our sexual essence, that this is not just a predetermined given package, that there is something that we perform. And right now, I'm actively performing in a certain way. You're right. actively performing. And the history of our repetitions, the history of our performances, that this, th these repetitions, these performances are what culture retroactively regulates as man and woman, right? Or whatever right. you're identifying as. Um, however, the, the negative side of um, Zupancic's view of Butler so there is a degree, there is a way in which um, Zupancic views Butler's program of performativity as something that is necessary, that is um, fundamental, and it, it, it's it's this it's it's this space of creativity that we do have, this space of performativity that we do have. However, the negative side of of um, this for Zupancic is that it takes gender to be something which is um, inherently non-problematic and liberating. Whereas for Zupancic, gender is fundamentally problematic because there's something negative at the core of sexuality itself. And the consequence of this is big because it doesn't lead us to a situation where we can just liberate ourselves and, and just play with our identities and everything will be great. It's more, if you're playing with your gender identity, you're tarrying with something very negative. You're tarrying with something which is going to be disorienting. You're tarrying with something which is going to be creating a whole bunch of neuroses in, inside of you. Mm -hmm. Like it's not mm -hmm. just a liberation from evil authority in the past. Right, right. It's, it's, right. it's, it's, it's no, th this is something really difficult here. So it's basically um, here to quote, she says, is involved in conceiving of the real as the point of internal impossibility and contradiction of being um, at the root of every ontology. And the concept of the real is precisely uh, what is lost when we pass from sex to gender. So it's this idea that when we just pass from sex to gender, we lose contact with the real. We lose like, and so we just think we're just, we're just thinking we're just free almost like a total blank slates constructivism, right? Right. Whereas the real is a limitation. The real is an impossibility. The real is a contradiction where uh, like, I mean, if I took seriously uh, playing with my gender, uh, I would probably be in for a nightmare of some kind, <laughs> like I would, you know? And I think that we have now, and this is not to, this is now, this is not to, I'm not putting any, um, political, I'm not making any political statements here about pro or against trans or anything like that. It's merely saying, and here even affirming trans identity is, um, this is something we need to have very mature conversations about. It's precisely for this, right. it's precisely for trans becoming a universal political category that we need to raise the bar of our conversation. Yes. Yes. And it's been lowered because there's basically the, no, it's very simple. There's just XX and XY chromosomes and 
you know, women are birthing machines and God had it all figured out a long time ago versus uh, it's whatever a person feels at the moment that they identify as that you just need to accept and affirm, no questions asked. And even at the level of children, you're just going to take their word that their identity is a one-to-one -one correlation, that A equals A, that this needs to be affirmed through, and the definition of affirmation has now become medicalized in a way that is beneficial for the pharmaceutical and cosmetic surgical industries. And there are contradictions in that approach uh, of where those standards of care and, af uh, and the definition of affirmation has been turned into something that is creating a lot of uh, problems, right? And so I've touched on this after Zizek touched on it, and I was like, this is a basic point. This is something that is needs to be thought through and not just considered, oh, raising concerns about the medicalization of ego psychology in this in this movement is is a right-wing talking point like right we cannot just stop there right but the right-wing side is absolutely looney tunes as well right and they they're, they're both they're, looney tunes they're both looney tunes right and you know i've already said it before i do believe in the cybernetic future i do believe that humans are going to become uh, at least some humans, not all. I mean, I guess Amish, Amish people will probably be here in 10,000 years. But the, you know, and, and a lot of other radical kinds of experiments that try to maintain some sense of something that was supposed to be human, that maintenance of that sense, the fact that it requires the continuation of the performance of cutting your facial hair in a certain way and wearing a certain kind of hat in every Orthodox community, in every society, there's always going to be people who want to keep certain traditions alive. Now, that doesn't have to be politicized. It doesn't have to be theocratic, etc. But uh, there will be people who want to go off planet and explore the stars and, and in various ways take on other sorts of radical experiments that leave behind these old bodies and maybe just modifying them to a, a point where they're no longer recognizable. And my, my position is one of radical support for such experimentation. And, yep. um, but, but to be pro technological acceleration without, but don't be naive about it. And especially not with, anyway, without having a radical critique of it, if you're supportive yeah. without critique or if you're critical without support, you're fucking wrong. And so with, uh, another course that we'll be launching soon at theory underground, it's digital literacy and critical media theory, thinking about, not just propaganda through people like Bernays and Chomsky and no, no, but thinking about how every technological extension, especially the media forms we use for perceiving and understanding reality, these are extensions of our central nervous system. And that's the McLuhan's point. The medium is the message and how that has to be thought through a, a Marxist standpoint, how that has to be thought through um, Heidegger's question concerning technology, how that has to be thought, thought through, uh, all of these other fundamental contri contributions to what I'm calling critical media theory, um, as well as in conjunction with digital literacy, which is more about how do you have a good life now, considering the fact that we're so addicted to the attention economy, which is really the distraction industry. How, how do we get to know ourselves when solitude is broken down and we think that we're in solitude, but we're not in solitude because we're with our phone, right? And how to, and in my book, the uh, se second chapter really gets into the breakdown of that virtuous circle between genuine being with other people and genuine being with oneself and how with if we're not thinking critically about our relationships to these devices, then we're not going to be able to, as Heidegger says, come into a freer relation with them. And so, right. you know, Descartes' dream of a, of a world of devices that allow us to seize and possess nature has been achieved. The question is, how are we seizing and possessing ourselves in a way that robs us from ourselves in a way where we don't even have that autonomous, creative control over becoming something different? Because right now, you get caught up in, in, in an industry that's selling you on solutions to what you need to be as opposed to one of radical experimentation that takes on free, autonomous, courageous exploration of the self and the heavens, right? So I, I wanted to be clear about that and just put that forward 
here and now because um, a lot of people don't have time to go over everything that's been talked about in the last couple months. And this is my position. It's been my position. And, and I just wanted to be clear about it. But bringing it back now. So what is the fear? What is the fear of uh, what, what occurs when we do not uh, approach this in this nuanced way that is able to tarry with the contradiction to tarry with the negative? And I think that leads us, that's the segue into the next point, isn't it? Well, I'll just say say quickly on 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 this point before just to like the the most the most clear formulation of the problem that I found in Zupanchic is the following, and it and it points towards both the traditional identity and the let's say the postmodern identity. Is that she says gender complementarity to multiplicity, so complementarity being men and women in a harmonious balance, and gender multiplicity. Just pick your own identity. Neither are thought of as inherently problematic, end quote. And Zizek says here, part of, here to bring in Zizek to the equation, he says, the paradox of the liberation of sexuality, meaning the liberation from binary oppressions, liberating sexuality into the gender multiplicity, has to end up in the liberation of humanity from sexuality. Meaning that the point is, is that sexuality as something fundamentally negative does not mean that you're just going to enjoy your free sexual expression. What it means is, is that when you liberate yourself from these binary categories, you're going to be confronting a singular negativity, which you learn, which is the, which is the negative force from which you build your, let's say self autonomous identity and you know your 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 historical persona so it's what it, what it means is ultimately is that you need to that that what you do with your sexuality has um huge consequences for the rest of your life um and that it's going to bring you in touch with a negative force which could either destroy you or you could sublate it for a higher order, perhaps a higher order mode of being. I hope that, that I, I don't know if that, that makes sense to you, but uh, sort of the, I got, the, I got, I, the core of the problem, I think. This is one of it's the problems. You can, see why the, you can see why there's an epistemology which is being severed from ontology because what's that? Cadell, you cut out. Sorry. Oh no. Am I still oh, here? No. Yeah, you it was just for a second, but you said still okay. having So the the point of the point that the disconnection of epistemology from ontology is basically because if you include a relation between epistemology and ontology, you have to confront a negative force which is uh, existentially disorienting. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I I did. I did get distracted by the stream because in the stream, uh, the uh, the they were like, "Dave, is that you in that picture with Rollins?" And so I was like, "Wait, what?" And they were someone was bringing up Peter Rollins and everything. And apparently, I'm in a picture. Shout out Peter Rollins. I'm in one of the pictures on his, on the Peter Rollins uh, Wikipedia. I did not know that, and so I was just kind of pulled into that for a second, but. Um, yeah, we love Peter Rollins. We've uh, both worked with Peter Rollins in the past. I brought him to a conference I organized as well as I did a stream with him one time. And I've been aiming to bring him back on sometime in the near future because I'm really excited to find out about the developments of his work and to talk about things that he's been doing. But if you want to check out something with Peter Rollins and Cadell, you just posted something, what, a week ago? Yeah, it's a conversation with Peter Rollins about the or his book, The Orthodox Heretic, and it, we dive into his concept of pyrotheology. We dive into his concept, uh, his event, Atheism for Lent. So, you know, Peter Rollins, super cool guy. I think he's occupying a very critical spot in the in the culture today. And uh, yeah, not enough good things to say. Perfect. Yeah, and so I kind of wanted to, on this note, on this point too, that we're on still with Foucault and Butler, to say a thing about the trap of this sort of beautiful soul 
utopian socialist, Rousseauian child, noble savage theme that seems to be something that will never really go away. It's probably here to stay. And there's always a little bit of truth to it because that, that there is something in our nature that is represented by that idea. Uh, but yeah, with Foucault and Butler, they're working in a scene where the new left assumption is that capitalism, in order to have its smooth functioning, in order for the empire to maintain its control, this tight nuclear family in the uh, suburb in the suburbs, you know this this image of what family life should be that was painted in the 1950s and sold to us as a part of the commodified like move towards consumerism. Um, that 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 empire and capital rely on this this American dream, th this specific version of it that requires a lot of discipline and sexual repression. Okay. And with uh, the works of like Reich and Marcuse and DNG, you definitely get this more intellectual version of what hippies at the ground were just thinking intuitively, which was, well, the way we overthrow that order, that white heterosis, you know, patriarchal, capitalist, yeah. imperial thing would be to liberate sexual desire, to unrepress ourselves and to exactly. become more creative, free, tear down the, the fences and let the pigs and partiers into the garden, right? And there's a lot of contradictions that arose over time. There's a lot of people who left the movement because they were seeing this. But the people who held on to that vision the most were the ones who stood to gain from it the most in terms of their personal life and their uh, careers. And that is just the professional managerial class, as the hippie generation graduated from radicalism and moved into the what they called the long march through the institutions and trying to possess the various institutions and reform them from inside out, the, the move went from genuine structural changes to, well, we can just do these small forms of individual liberation and lifestyle consumer like uh, changes. We can modify our diet. We can modify our appearance. We can modify our relationships. And by doing that, we will be able to change the world. And obviously, from anybody who's got this structural critique of capital, it's, well, capital has no problem uh, selling that right back to us. And yep. there, I don't want to say Foucault is reducible to that because he's not, because he's important on his own and needs to be read on his own terms, of course. But uh, what David Graeber calls vulgar Foucauldianism in the PMC, in that paper that you and I have talked about in the past privately called Anthropology in the Professional Managerial Class, where he's talking about how anthropology uh, uh, as a discipline, but also just like departments across the United States and Canada and the UK, had become sites of this pseudo-radical uh, performativity lifestyle consumer, you know, you know, it's all just like a show of like, oh, we care about microaggressions and 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 the way that we'll overthrow everything oppressive oppressive is to center and uplift and empower. And it's just all the things being critiqued in the PMC course at Theory Underground. But to bring it all back, the point is, is that to liberate desire, capitalism has been liberating desire since its inception. Mm -hmm. No, this is this is such an important point you're making. And I think that is actually the core point we're reacting against. And the, 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 the core point is this idea that we were repressed by religion. We were repressed by patriarchy. And we just need to liberate ourselves from these concepts. We need to liberate ourselves from these laws. And then we'll be free. That's the misconception. So let me just, before we move on to the next topic, let me just give a quote from Alenka Zupanchich on Michel Foucault's history of sexuality. Wonderful. So she said, in regards to modern societies, sexuality has been anything but repressed. We have been witnessing, with respect to sexuality, a gigantic incitement to discourse, the, impla the implantation of perversity, the gesture of bringing sexuality into focus under the spotlight, seeing it everywhere, making it and even forcing it to speak all the time. She says, furthermore, to continue the quote, 
What is lacking from Foucault's account is the notion of the unconscious and of repression in the Freudian sense, which is not mentioned in the history of sexuality, a founding negativity of sexuality itself, which is, of course, primal trauma, the founding, cast, the idea of symbolic castration, that it's not just, we're not just oppressed by laws and symbols because of social, social reasons. That's not, that's not why. There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a castration which functions on the level of the unconscious itself. And, and that's, why, that's why Lacan has his symbol for the subject as what? As the barred subject. It's not that you can just take the bar off. Right? It's, 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 it's not right. coming. It's not because, it's not be, it's not because uh, the government or it's not because of the schools that you are oppressed. No. It's not why. <laughs> well and obviously so they, it's just, they have we their, need a they... more we, we we need a psychoanalytic notion of oppression we need a we need a psycho we need a psychosocial notion of oppression where it's not just the social side it's also repression functions inside of us we right. repress ourselves a point that zizek makes about the id which i think is brilliant he says the id is more moral than we think and the super ego is more perverse than we think. You know, so usually we think the it is perverse and the super ego is the moral authority. He says, no, it's much more complex than that. The id is, he said, the good news is that the id is more moral than we think. And the bad news is that the super ego is more perverse than we think. It's a super interesting point, no? Like, no, yeah. That's really good. That's really good. And it had me remember that I, I left a thread unfinished that I just wanted to wrap back around. The idea of the, the cellar full of dogs, the repressed, right, um, is not the Lacanian update on this at all, right? It's not a mad, roiling, uh, you know, instinctual but irrational and, and a sort of crazy, wild set of impulses that have been repressed uh, by socialization, Right, this the the Nietzschean idea of like yeah, but you know that that person that 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 wild animal gets domesticated into a society. It gets subjectivized. It gets trained. It gets disciplined. It gets punished in Foucault's sense. Um, be be the Lacanian move is away from this idea of repression as that right, and it's something more, much more intelligent. So I wanted to make sure that that gets brought up in this conversation because I felt like otherwise it could have been thought that I was. Uh, you know, just kind of carrying that old idea forward. And so you reminded me of it by bringing in the id. But the id is also a site of potential. It's a site of intelligence. It knows things that we don't know, right? Yeah. And at the super egoic level, nothing is more oppressive than our moral compass. Mo nothing is more oppressive than the conflation between our sense for wanting to be moral subjects and the ethical norms installed in us. And obviously Foucault and Butler and everyone in between have their important pieces of the puzzle to add. But like you said, yeah. they don't think the unconscious and the heterosis, uh, uh, the heterosis normative matrix of intelligibility as Judith Butler talks about. Yes, it does exist. There is this heterosis normative matrix of intelligibility and we could say it's big other and and there's also the transgressive superego that says that we should enjoy despite it and that is also something that has been fully commodified and sold back to us right and yeah uh, obviously the right wing has monopolized being critical of that left superego right ha yeah. of its con of its contradictions of its a uh, false sense of superiority and raisonnement and blah, 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 blah. So you can get a cheap critique of it, a cheap superficial critique of it from that side of the internet. But that's... From PragerU. From PragerU. Yeah, you can. Just, you can get just go, it to, go, go over to PragerU if you don't want to mess with Theory Underground. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. Shout out to David Prager. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, the billionaire, the billionaire who started his own you know, platform so that he can justify saying that women have to have sex with him when he wants them to or whatever, you know, it's a, 
<laughs> it's an interesting thing. So oh, you said that about his wife, I think, right? Right. Yeah, but no, the, exactly. this is this this is a this is a serious this is a serious connecting point. Like, and and we can get into that. But like, I just want to give that like maybe that example of David Prager saying, "Oh, well, the wife just has to have sex with the husband, whatever," because that's that's an example of a traditional norm. Yeah. And the like, and it, the thing is, is that the problem today, and this will be a good, we, you can segue into the next point. This will be a good segue is the problem with that. Here's the thing. I do identify as a leftist. Tentatively, it's become more complicated to identify as a leftist today, of course. And I know you've had got some comments on that and feelings about that yourself. My point, my, the way I stand today is that I stand as a negative leftist. Meaning that I'm a leftist who critiques the left because, yeah. and the reason why is because if leftism continues to be naive progressivism and positive constructivism, yeah. this is precisely the space where conservatism can exploit leftism. Because if leftism, if leftism is just naive progressivism and positive constructivism, conservatism is just going to dominate that because it's just it's just such a weak political yeah. narrative yes so we need i want to be i my what i try to be is someone who is like the tough dad of the left i want to be the tough dad of the left <laughs> it's like anything you come to me with your bullshit and i'll call i'll just i'll try to be a nice dad about no no, we got enough. There's enough. There's enough nice dads, um, and, and that's not to say we need bully dads, you know, or performative. No, no, bully. I don't want to be a like, bully either. You know, performative bully dad would be someone like Vosh, right? This is not the point. The point is what we need. Yes, we need people to. Yeah, okay. The the segue here is radical responsibility. If you want to change the world, if you have the privilege to be able to uh, leverage towards world change then you have a very special responsibility that is very different from somebody who has to work 70 hours a week at two different jobs to try to support their kids. Okay, you've got a very special kind of responsibility that is very different from that person who is struggling just to keep their head above water, who does not have the time and energy to read, who is structurally stultified and functionally illiterate. You have a special responsibility to not be duped by ideology in ways that they are and to not scorn them for being susceptible to self-congratulatory, self-isolating little cocoon narratives that give them a sense of belonging in the world. No, your role is to raise the level on yourself first, right? It's that get the, get the log out of your own eye before you look at the speck in your brother's eye principle. Yeah. And so um, the, the, the utter stupidity and insanity of what you're calling naive progressivism today, the reactionary element of it is that on the one hand, it's not taking radical responsibility seriously. It's in a sort of sense, radical disavowal and always what about ism and pointing at the other side and lesser of two evil, get out of everything. And on the other side, it's reactionary in the sense that it gives reactionaries an easy win. It makes yes. it so easy. So people are like, wow, they just can't shut up about the trans stuff right now. Yeah, well, guess what? The current discourse has made it easy for them to win this one. We're gonna watch it for the next decade. It's not gonna go away. If you think it's gonna go away, I would like to welcome you to reality. This next decade is not going to be pretty. That's why we want to raise the level of this discourse, at least for our own selves. We don't expect that this will yeah. reach the masses, but we do believe that there needs to be a place for people who want to genuinely think and tarry with the negative here to yeah. be able to intervene locally, at least when it, when they are say at the, 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 the family get together and they see, this kind of discourse arising to be able to be like, I'm not going to get hooked into this double blackmail as Slavoj would call it. And so yeah. point number three, you're right, is a perfect segue. It goes paradoxes of free sexuality leading to anxiety slash social paralysis. We risk conservative slash fascist return to traditional slash orthodox views of sexuality. It's a big problem. And I think it's a, it's a, to me, this is, to me, this is the issue and this is the level at which we need to derive 
I've heard you say like we need different signifiers. Um, a lot of what Alenka Zupancic will point towards and what is sex is, you know, the magic of finding the right signifier. You know, like you stumble upon the right signifier, which 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 works. And maybe we are at a uh, in a situation where the signifiers left and right don't work anymore. I know you've pointed towards that, and that could very well be the situation we're in. Which, in that case, we're basically at a breaking of the foundation of the modern world, because as you know, with the French Revolution and the establishment of a secular um, state, is that you have the appearance of left and right. Right, left and right are very modern signifiers, and if we're if we're at the level of breaking down of left and right, then we're 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 very much entering a different political landscape than the modern political landscape. Um, in any case, I really do feel like the left has 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 messed up on this issue of free sexuality, and at the and it's at the ground of the conversation. And here there is now. Let me give in now to prove that we're actually being nuanced theorists. There's an interesting relationship between Freud and Luz on the issue of repression and repetition, which I think is really important. Is that Deleuze said against Freud, um, and I think Lacan and Zupancic picked this up. Is Deleuze says um, we don't repeat because we repress; we repress because we repeat. So basically, now this is a now this is something. It's a head spinning thing, but like there's a loop between repetition and repression, and it's basically like Freud is on the side of repression, and Deleuze is on the side of repetition. And basically, what this makes me think is that instead of think, basically, what it makes me think is we need to learn how to repress well. We need to learn how to repress better. Then here's the thing. We need to learn how to repress better than traditional or fundamentalist religions do. If we can repress better than they do, we win the culture. And what that means is, is we have to ask ourselves, what repetitions do we want? Because basically, what rep like basically rep repression is in relationship to what you want to keep repeating. Like, because you can't, like, like your critique of, of, of the, the, that uh, leftist crowd and the free sexuality is, we can't just be everything. You can't just have sex with everyone. You can't just be every identity. You have to repress, but you have to pick the repetition. Like, and that's the positive affirmation is what do you want to repeat? So just we could go on, we could go on a little bit further, but I really think this is where the culture war is. And the thing is, is that the traditional identities, here's the here's why we're at a disadvantage in the in the culture wars. Is because the traditional identities and the fundamentalist religion, they have the repetition answer for you. We know exactly what you should be repeating. Right. And we know exactly how you should be repressing. And what the leftists are saying is, no, you friggin' don't. Right. That knowledge is useful. That knowledge has a place. But it's not going to work on a universal level for modern global subjectivity. It's not no. going to work. We no. need to have a more sophisticated understanding of repetition. We need to have a more sophisticated understanding of repression. And that's where the left drops the ball. And that's where I think we need to have the conversation raised all the way up. And now I'm Damn. getting passionate about it because apparently I've hit something here. <laughs> yeah, no, and the chat's going off too. I think a lot of people are feeling the energy right now. So, you know, this, I hadn't really thought about it. And I, I want to see if you agree with Secret Asian Dan in the chat who said, repetition is the lower level behavioral basis of what we do. Repression is on a higher level post hoc justification that solidifies into ideology. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think I think that I think that what he's articulating needs to be thought in a feedback loop. And it depends like you can become ideologue like in this example I'm giving about Deleuze and Freud is you could say Deleuze was now Deleuze is re, is is like becoming a partisan for rep repetition and Freud is becoming a partisan for repression. And both are in some sense mistakes because like if you think about what we were talking about Deleuzeans, they want to be bumblebees. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's what that. But that's what happens when you reify re repetition. 
is you just become a bumblebee or you just become a mushroom or you just become an amoeba because it's that lower it's that lower level but I, so but now here's the hegelian dialectical point about lower because he said quote am i right to say he said repetition is lower yes that was what secret agent dan so, was proposing okay so to secret this is to secret agent dan so the repetition is lower so here's the hegelian point on Deleuzian repetition is that for Hegel, the lower is higher. So you have to keep, you have to keep it in a loop. So the, the, the so what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, is that an interest and this, I'm thinking through this in the live, right? Like I'm just thinking about this as, a, as we're going, but yeah. what I'm thinking about is there is a dialogue to be had between Freud and Deleuze on repetition and repression. And it could be that, Lacan and Zupanchich are so helpful of with us. So here's another plug for what is sex. Lacan and Zupanchich can help us think through this loop because there's a more sophisticated dialectical relationship between the two than we're led to believe with just the reification of repetition or the reification of repression. So that's why Lacanians sometimes critique Freudians for being too patriarchal centric, paradoxically, and why perhaps Lacanians would also critique Deleuzeans for being too, in some sense, post-humanist or even pre-humanist. Mm. 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 This is, this is, this is powerful stuff, I think. Yes. Now I want to say, I'm sorry, but I think my computer might be lagging out or it might be your internet. You came through perfect at the level of voice, but your video is getting a little choppy. Um, and so I, I apologize for that. I'm not sure whose fault it is or what's going on. And I, I hope that the stream's not garbage, everybody. I hope that you're all able to get the point. I hope that you're all hearing what we're saying and that you're seeing the significance of this amazing text and that you're getting a sense for the dynamic that Cadell and I are developing in dialogue because currently there is not a place on the internet, I do not believe, that is going to take you through lectures the way that this plebe has been taking people through lectures with Michael Downs and now Cadell Last, which is to say my position is one of having a sense for my audience, for having a sense of not all working class intellectuals, that would be absurd, but for having a sense of what it is to be profoundly confused as an outsider to these discourses, not having any bearing in the discourse, and working, listening with earbuds, going, what the fuck are they talking about? And after my 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 period of influencership or attempt, you know, getting involved with left tube and bread tube and all the stuff back in the day, realizing that's not what's needed. What's needed is a person to take on the position of student sometimes, right? Like to take on the position of uplifting others that in my case, I'm, I'm going to uplift the people that I can learn from. If I see someone is really good at breaking things down, if I see that I am good at learning from them, but also I go, okay, but how to make this even more accessible and dynamic for people who are entering the discourse at an earlier stage. I just have to think through my earlier ears, through my earlier eyes, and try to bring it, this all to, into contact with relatable examples and so I hope that you're getting a sense that this interview lecture dynamic that we've been developing at Theory Underground is, yeah. is kind of taken, I think, to another level here with, with, the, with the help of your slides and the fact that you've already taught on this in the past and that, you know, I, so I really, I think that and there's a lot. We just went into one slide. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to do a whole, we're going to do a whole presentation next week. So, yeah. so keep out a lookout for that. Yeah. Next week, uh, same place, same time. Is that what the plan was? And then you will be on. It'll account? be on. It'll be on my channel. But so different place, but same time. Different. Oh place no no time. no no so, uh, no so okay so no so different place. We're going to be doing it not live, but we're going to have an event which you can att you can attend an event live. So watch out, Dave and I will both announce an event which you can attend, and then we're going to post it live on Sunday next week. Right. So, so look out for that from both Dave and I. We'll, we'll let you know. There'll be a live event you can attend. Right. So you, there will be probably, uh, okay. There's two ways to sign up for the course. 
Um, it's at our respective websites. Each of us yep. will make a comment in the comment section with a link to our website. People who are already involved with Theory Underground, uh, there will be a forum dedicated to this. And that way, as people matriculate into Theory Underground over the course of the next few years, as I do the, the countrywide tour and then go into Europe doing interviews and presentations and events with the people who will be in Underground Theory Volume 1 and working on a documentary and, and doing all these speaking tour kind of events and this it's sort of like a prolonged conference party. Um, I, I plan cool. on me. I, I plan on meeting with Cadell as well as so many other people. We've got to do some cool stuff. We got to. We're going to do, do some, some cool really stuff. cool shit. Yeah, and uh, but as people join in the future, they will watch this. This is canonical to the introduction to this text at Theory Underground now. Absolutely. And uh, it, there will be levels of involvement. There's tiers of involvement. I, I, I'm learning from the business side from here from Cadell, uh, and the fact is is. This is not sustainable if I faint at the restaurant with my fiance. If I okay, let me say something quick. Yes. So go ahead. I just want to. I just want to say that just like le the left leftists leftists need to take sexuality more seriously on the level of, of repetition rep repression. Leftists need to take business more seriously. We we can't compete with PragerU if they've got all the business and they've got all that law on lock and they do. We can't compete that. We got to do business. Right. And we can't now, and we can't critique capital. We can't critique capital well unless we're building businesses. Right. Right. And because we're on the internet where everything's been given away for free because of platform capitalism over the last 20 years and trust us, it's coming back to take that by the pound from your flesh, right? It's been giving you everything for free in the digital sphere. But it's coming back with a vengeance to take it out by the pound in your flesh. Okay, uh, platform capitalism. Nick Cernichek wrote a. Is it Nick Cernichek? Yeah, he wrote a fantastic book on this, and uh, it's called Platform Capitalism. And the the model is it's it's a more elaborate form of the model that was uh, was around in the Walmart days, which is a biz a, a local Walmart branch is willing to take a loss for 10 years not being profitable just to put all the mom and pop shops in locally out of business to even put the Kmart out of business right the shopco out of business the Walmart is willing to take a loss to put everyone else out of business before raising its prices back up and because it has the economies of scale and distribution it's able to say okay well we can put we can build a new Walmart here and put these people out of business and take a loss here and we can supplement that loss that it's taking on locally over here by taking from the profits that we have other local areas and redirecting those over here. So obviously we don't have that ability, but the internet is based on that same idea. Tech companies, the, 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 the struggle and the race and the investment is all revolving around building up monopolies, Amazon, PayPal, etc. These monopolies define the next 20 years. And Right now, we are getting it pretty cheap and relatively free on the side of, say, Netflix and Hulu and Prime and all of these entertainment streaming, uh, you know, basically Hollywood uh, platforms that are competing with one another. It's creating a lot of wonderful shows. It's creating a lot of wonderful movies. And right now, we're really enjoying them. But guess what? It's a matter of time until they're put behind higher and higher paywalls before it's going to be harder and harder to access these things that we're currently groomed to expect to get for free, okay, or for relatively cheap. So the point is, is that from the side of us, Philosophy Portal and Theory Underground, we have material basis in reality. We have actual food to put on the table. We have rent that we have to pay. I moved to Mexico for the first few months of Theory Underground so that I can save enough. I mean, I also want to learn Spanish and you know get to know people and everything. But also to strategically say, be able to cut costs so that I'm able to focus on putting my time and energy into Theory Underground without having to work another job. Because guess what? I was working at Amazon and I was not able to develop this the way that I wanted to. And so when I passed out two and a half weeks ago, I literally, my eyes rolled up in the back of my head. I fainted against the wall in front of my fiance who was horrified and jumped up and shook me and everything like that. 
I had never been more exhausted in my life. I came to 15 seconds later with my white face and my purple lips and and it, I, it took like an hour to even be able to walk and I've been slowly recovering my energy since then but my stamina is not coming back as fast and my endurance. So it's, it's going to take time and so I'm trying to pace myself and why do I say all of this? It's because time and energy are the basis of labor power but also you everything you eat, everything you enjoy is made by other people. You know, you, you're eating some uh, chicken fried rice or some pork fried rice. Guess what? How many farms are involved in the maintenance of that? How many, or the making of that? How many trucks and lines of supply were necessary in the making of that, right? There is a material basis between every, behind everything. And, you know, it's commodity fetishism to take it as a thing itself. When in reality, it's just a step in a process and the price that's on it is not the price of its actual value. The price of it is not the same as its cost. The cost in terms of the social and cultural exploitation is immense. Obviously, the planetary exploitation is immense. And so anyway, all of this stuff that I've been putting out on this channel, all of this stuff that I've been putting up on this website, it costs. I have to pay for everything as well as try to think, is there a future in this? And so be, I, I have taken inspiration from Cadell's uh, platform and approach, which is to say I've added tiers of involvement to the courses. So for my own course, I've added four tiers of involvement. And if you want to get in at the base level, that'll be the cheapest. You get the basic package. You're going to have a good course and you'll be a part of the conversation. And that's what, that's what matters the most. But the tier, the tiers of involvement go up and at the highest level, you get everything at the lower tiers. you you know, the program at this point, but you, uh, that's where you get my time and energy. Level three is where you actually get my critical feedback. From now on, I'm not going to promise people critical feedback because that requires honesty. It requires me taking a risk. It requires me giving you a lot of time and energy and attention. And that takes a lot out of me. And so that's tier three. Tier four is all of that plus a couple of dedicated conversations, one during the course and one after the course, one during the course of, about a passage of the text that you're working through and thinking about, and then the other one on your final project. And so I just wanted to say, that there is a that, that that I'm rolling out a new sort of pricing tier program, and that the what, what's in it for Cadell right now, besides the fact that I think we both get a lot from having these conversations, and and, and, and at the money side, we're, we're, it makes it possible so that we could actually put a lot of energy out into this kind of work for you all. But yeah, we're putting every, you're going to get the best education here in the world. I yeah we're. Th uh, look, some dude, some dude in the chat just said this is the smartest stream on YouTube. Might well be, but the thing is, is that that, like, just to echo what you're what you're saying is, back when I started YouTube, I was putting out less than nothing. What is sex? As video lectures, just uploaded for free. Now they've got they've got a, a substantial number of views, and I'm happy that it's reached the people that it has. But since starting philosophy, now I couldn't just do that and keep doing that because I don't make any money from that. But, and I live in the world. But the, the thing is, is that in creating philosophy portal, basically what you're getting is on the internet today, you can get all information. But what we're creating are concentrated containers where you can get a proper educational experience, which is absolutely invaluable. And the thing is, is that I've been able to develop relationships with students who can develop student teacher relationships and can develop their own projects in a way that you can't do it just watching YouTube videos by yourself. You can't do it just watching YouTube videos by yourself. You have to have that con constrained experience of working with someone who has put in their time and energy to perfecting a craft or developing a craft and then sharing that with the next generation. And that we create real communities. And on top of that, we're not just creating this virtually. We want to create this physically as well. Right. We want to do on the ground events. Right. We want to do, I've done, re, I've done retreats with Philosophy Portal. I'm going to do retreats in the future. I want to learn how to do festivals. I want to learn how to do events. Right. You're doing that. You're doing a, a US tour. We want to create a, a literal virtual oasis 
where right. we're not trying to exploit I and mean, we're not trying to exploit sexual difference. We're not here saying men, good women, bad or women, good men, bad. We're not doing the ideological game. We're trying to raise the bar of the conversation high. Um, and we're trying to, to, to demonstrate clear reasons why this is a text worth thinking about today. Right. And we also want to create on the ground spaces where we can create a new intellectual culture. Right. Period. And as and and look, we live in the world. There's 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 sexual uh, conflicts. There's uh, social conflicts. There's economic conflicts. There's political conflicts. We have to learn how to tarry with these in a higher order way. But we have to get involved. We have to build businesses. We have to have real relationships. There's going to be negativities. And I'll, I'll, I'll end there. I would just want to interject really quick into the death con secret agent, Dan, uh, at, uh, Adam mad, uh, discourse going on in the chat that I, I think it's a very important conversation. It's a side conversation. It's not the conversation that we're having here right now. And it's a bucket of worms that, invites a lot of complexity and needs to be thought through in a sophisticated way. And my big frustration of the last 10 years is people talking without a shared basis in texts. And I think that you're all wasting your time. If you want to have a conversation about education today and homeschooling versus public schooling and everything, you're going to want to have a shared basis in critical media theory, sorry, critical pedagogy. You're going to want to have a shared basis in the course at Theory Underground called the idea of the university, which is only the first bus to depart on or the first train to, de to depart on the line un under the good life, under the bracket of education. There's a few more. And uh, this. Yeah. So I just want you all to to feel encouraged to join the conversation on the basis of shared texts and shared uh, and, and time spent critically go reflecting on your own research, which is what we're doing here. So yeah, but, but yeah, that's, it's a side conversation. So to bring it all back around, um, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're not just going to be some online thing where we have a basis in the world. Like the, a lot of the people who are going to yep. be published in underground theory, volume one are people from where I started out in Boise, Idaho doing this. And the launch of the countrywide tour is departing from Boise and then going across to the East Coast and back again. And when this ends, I'm going to roll the commercial that I've been showing at the end of my videos about the U.S. tour so that those who are new to this can get a sense for what that's all about and ways of getting involved. But um, yeah, is it OK? So anything else we want to say in close, though? Yeah, yeah, I can. Let me just say something in closing. Oh, because so, oh, and I because I, I I actually was I was setting you up to say a thing about how this fits into your decree. So yeah, make okay, sure to tie sure. that in. So yeah, that's that's what I was going to mention anyway. So thanks for that. Um, okay. First off, thanks to Dave. Thanks for Theory Underground. I mean, since I you know I saw you guys doing great work, and um, you know getting a chance to collaborate with you and work with you guys has been an absolute joy. And on the first level, the reason why I'm collaborating with you is because I respect what you do. I respect your grind. I see a lot of potential in it. And I want to, you know, I want, I want to, I want to participate in a new intellectual culture. And I see theory underground as a, a space for that. Um, and I hope philosophy portal can also be a space for that. And um, if anyone's interested in learning about more about philosophy portal, what we've done, our courses are not just courses. They're also organized towards creative projects and retreats and uh, conferences and anthologies where you can actually develop your intellectual mind with others who are also reading through the same texts and you're part of an intellectual community. And I think that that's so crucial. You're not going to get that. You're, you're not even going to get that experience at a university because a conference is not something that you, a conference is not composed of people who you've moved through the same, same course with. It's disparate individuals fighting for academic jobs, basically. Right. And when you, and, and, and when, and you, and you're not publishing a community work, like the anthologies we've made, they're community works. People are internally citing each other and building off of each other's work. This is not a typical peer reviewed journal. So we're trying to pioneer a different style of academic work.
And I think that that's more necessary now than ever in the age of automation, in the age where it's been revealed that the university publication and the university essay is something that a fuck, an AI can write. So now we, so we're pioneering a different mode of academic work. Right. Um, and, and that's, and, and my foundation for philosophy portal is to teach the foundational thinkers of the modern world. What is the intellectual foundation of the modern world? We better have a deep as possible understanding of what it is if we're going to do anything beyond the modern world, because we have to understand what we're standing on. We have to understand what we're building on and towards, and it has to be an Iron Man engagement. So in my classes, I try to give an Iron Man engagement. I'm trying to teach the best as possible phenomenology of spirit, the best as possible, thus spoke Zarathustra. And coming up in July, the best as possible Lacan's Cree. And so the here, this collaboration with Dave is that what is sex is a text written by one of the best contemporary Lacanian theorists. And she's approaching a specific question. And I think that these intensive mini courses are going to give you the, the understanding you need to go into something like the Acre. So if you, if you want to get exposed to the contemporary Lacanian theory, what is sex is going to be the place to be then if you want to learn the foundation of Lacan's core writings, then Philosophy Portal this summer is where you want to be. Because all this summer and into the fall, we are going to be doing an extensive deep dive into Lacan's Acre, which is his core writings. Um, and it's going to be a community event. There's going to be, a, you can write, you can develop your own ideas. You can write. And again, just like Dave has different tiers, if you just want free content that's on my youtube channel free content is just on my youtube channel all the great lectures you're getting a top level education just for free then the courses there are tiers you want just the recorded course it's pretty cheap for the level of the content you're getting it's dirt cheap then there are tiers where you can get more and more time and energy of what we're what we're giving. You can work one on one. You can attend the lives. You know, you can get as involved as you want and you're immersing yourself in an intellectual community where there are guys in their 20s and guys in their early development who are working through and really seriously tarrying with difficult ideas. It's much better to be in a real intellectual community than to just be looking at images on Instagram or TikTok. That's not an education. An education no. is education is not necessarily base level pleasure. If you're just scrolling on Instagram, that's base level pleasure. This is not this is going beyond that. And that's what and that's and, and I don't want to work with people who aren't willing to go beyond that. I only want to work with students who are trying to Go beyond that pleasure principle. So I'll end there. And thank you, Dave, for this uh, space. I think this has been great. Thank you so much. And Cadell, I'm about to roll the commercial here. And then after the commercial is over, I'll come back to show you all how to sign up. And I will say a thing about if you're a working class person who's completely strapped for cash, like I have a scholarship system. I'll show you how that works when, it, when I come back after the commercial break. Um, but for now, I'm going to go talk to Cadell in private just to kind of close this conversation out. And I'm going to roll the commercial for you all. Everybody, thank you so much for being here for the live stream. Uh, this is the only part of this course that is going to be in full, available, public live. But like Cadell said, also, if you just don't have the ability to take a course right now, there's a lot of free content that has been made that you can go through that especially with the PMC course, I've made it so that that entire course, as well as all the readings and excerpts and stuff, is something that you can binge while working if you have the kind of job like I did at Amazon or like I've always had in construction where I'm able to listen, right? Okay, but with all that said, thank you so much, Cadell, for joining for the live side of this. It's been an absolute honor and pleasure and uh, I've enjoyed it. All right. Me too. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone who stayed with us for the, for the whole two hours. Yeah, my God. Thank you, everybody.
attempt to bring in new people to the world of philosophy and theory while building on relationships already established, we are doing a countrywide tour of the United States this fall. What's up, guys? It's Anna Dave. Are we coming to a city or a town near you? Do you think there is a venue or audience in your local region that would be interested in a lecture or facilitated discussion about existentialism, critiques of therapism, PMC ideology, self-help, introduction to philosophy, or the time energy critique of any of those things? This speaking and discussion facilitation tour will include the Pacific Northwest in mid-August, the Kansas City, Missouri area late August or early September, Philadelphia at the beginning of October, and really we're going to be all over the area there, hopefully, so get in contact with us if you think that we should come visit your state. Phoenix, Arizona, mid-October, and SoCal, especially San Diego, late October. I say especially San Diego because we already have our guide for the San Diego region. What's the difference between a host, a guide, and a volunteer, you ask? Well, thanks for asking, actually. The volunteer role is for people who want to put up posters or in other ways promote the events that will be occurring in their town or city. Whereas the host might have a guest bedroom, guest house, or a place that we can park our van so that we can sleep in our van. We need to know if you would have like bathroom facilities or anything like that. And so the form on the website is where you can tell us what you have to offer. Guiding on the other hand though, people who love to guide take a lot of pride in their local knowledge. A good example of that would be Michael Downs when I visited him in Raytown, Missouri, and he took me into Kansas City and we had barbecue and he took me to the mall and to all these other landmark places from his life growing up there. Um, but a more recent example would be my friend Michael in Poland who took us around Katowice, Poland and basically gives a historical and sociological analysis of everything and it was amazing. It was, it was one of the coolest things we've ever experienced and it made us realize some people just want to provide the space and privacy whereas other people want to take you out and show you around and so if you're interested in being a volunteer host or guide we have a special form for that so please fill out your information and uh, get in contact with us as soon as possible so we can fit you into the schedule because we'll love to meet you touch base with the local community and if you don't think anyone else in your area is interested in the things that you're interested in, if you don't think anyone else is into this stuff, well, we might be able to surprise you. When I saw that poster, Bolgrillard in Boise fucking Idaho, are you kidding me? It was virtually an, an answer to an unspoken prayer, you know, it really was. And I just couldn't believe that somebody was interested in the things that I was interested in that I had been interested in for years and had kind of given up on in, in futility. I'd labored in solitude for so long, I had no one to talk to about it, no one to bounce ideas off. This tour is going to bring together a lot of people who want to be based in text with the people they're in conversation with. and. Yeah, I think it's going to be a fantastic year. The only other thing that I want to say is that Michael Downs' first book is going to be published by Theory Underground really soon here. I've got another book coming out really soon here. These books will be spread throughout the United States on this tour. So I'm hoping to be able to do some actual book launch events at various bookstores. Outside of that, I guess the last thing that I would say is that Michael Downs is gearing up to teach For They Know Not What They Do by Slavoj Žižek. We're putting out all these introduction videos and other interviews related to the topic of Hegel, Lacan, Žižek because we want to give people an accessible and sturdy basis in the discourse. The problem is, is that Michael Downs is very busy having to work at a wage slave job. And so if you want to help in freeing Mikey, make sure to go to his Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the dangerous baby and make a donation thank you i would be remiss to close this out without a quick shout out to our patrons and our anonymous donors thank you so much for the donations already we've only been around for a month we already got 
over three thousand dollars in donations um and so thank you and uh stay tuned for the app which is on its way there will be a theory underground app so the current setup is that it is a social media site built around courses where you can suppose that people who are involved in the discussions have a shared interest in the same or similar texts and where you can assume in a lot of the discussions that yeah people have read the stuff that you're reading uh that you're bringing into dialogue and so uh for instance the idea of the university by carl jaspers dedicated for him Slavoj Zizek's for they don't know what they do dedicated for him and then as people take the course over the years new people will be coming into that forum and so if you get in there early you'll be able to see how the conversation evolves and as new people add into the conversation it'll bring back memories and like things that you want to work through questions that you had with the first time that you read the text and so i'm really excited for this the reason i've built this website is because i think that this is what's lacking in so many other spaces is that ability to return to be able to communicate after the fact and in a sustained way on a platform that's not attention grabby and annoying like discord and so stay tuned because there is an app on the way thank you to our donors if you want to donate go to theory underground.com forward slash support thank you All right, all right, everybody. I promised that I would say a couple of things here before we closed out completely. So to the people who are still with us, who watched the whole commercial in the live chat, let me know that you're still there if you're still there. And for everybody joining in the future, welcome, welcome, welcome. What I wanna show you all really quick is two important things that were not really included in that commercial, which is, I mean, because that was a bit of an older commercial and a lot has happened since I originally edited it. Check this out though. So what I'm going to show you is over here on my other screen. Let's see if I can set it up. Yeah, this is the course. Look at it. What is sex? It says $150 to $750. Okay. That is the value of this course, but the, but there is also a level of, uh, well, there's a sale that started today and goes on until the end of this month. All right. And so the sale is what I kind of want to show you and talk to you about. And I want to, I want to help everybody get a sense for what's going on here. So let's see, am I able to see myself? Are you able to see myself? So this is theory underground. Um, I'm showing you where the actual site is, but what I want to draw your attention to is kind of just the basic, how this works. How does this website work? What's going on here? Um, Mikey keeps calling it the the first theory Facebook to ever exist. You know, it, it has some of the functions of, of Facebook. And whether you're just purchasing access to the course or if you're actually getting involved with, you have like an intention of joining the, the conversation going on on the public side of the forum or on any of these dedicated forums, it's all through signing up right here. In the top right, you can see sign up. And uh, that's where you can register. That's where you can create your screen name and uh, you, you know make a profile picture you know so that people can see you or something that represents you. And uh, when you go to theory-underground.com, H-T-T-P-S colon forward slash forward slash theory-underground.com, if you don't you put if you don't have the S in there, it's not going to be secure and you're not going to be able to stay logged in because that's apparently the way that it works. You will see there's a login area. There's a sort of glimpse into the sort of social media aspect of things. You can see people are getting achievements for signing up. That's also where you would have seen on the day that Nance got an achievement for doing an exegetical reading last week. Um, you've got the, those general areas I talked about in this stream, political and social theory, the good life, heretics and hysterics, and special cultural topics. Um, that is the, the, the major four, except that I, earlier when I was talking about the major four, I talked about introduction to philosophy as being one of the major four. So it's heretics and hysterics is its own special category. Anyway, this is an outdated schedule that I need to update. Um, this is all 
one a one person operation and so I'm a little bit behind on getting some of the things worked out but you can see some of the stuff that I've published here you can get the free side of my first book here each of the chapters is available in both print and um, audiobook style so if you scroll down you'll be able to play the you can actually play me reading it right here from my actual book Boom, boom, boom. So anyway, yeah, you can you can get to Waypoint this way. And then if you want your own physical copy, it's cheaper to purchase it from my website than it is from Amazon. So from the homepage, you're able to go to the Courses tab. At the Courses tab, you'll be able to see all of what's on offer currently. Mikey teaches Zizek before they know not what they do. Professional manager of class consciousness and ideology. The idea of the university and what is sex. And so if you click on what is sex and then you decide to take this course and you click on that, it says it's $99 to $549. That's because the sale is currently in effect. The sale goes on until the end of the month and this is where you can pick one of your four tiers. It took me like seven hours to figure out how to set up so many aspects of what I'm currently showing you. And it's all a work in progress. So bear with me. Let me know if you have any problems getting in there. And the biggest problem with getting in there might be that you're just broke. Michael Downs and I are both a couple of warehouse workers who have been barred access to courses in the past because they had a big price tag on them. And so that's why we're sensitive to this issue. And so if you go to the store tab, at the top of the, head, the header here, you'll see that there is actually a scholarship opportunity. If you scroll down, you got this wonderful testimonial from Bert talking about why he's a $50 patron. And uh, you probably saw a little bit of that in the commercial earlier. But if you scroll down, you got a bunch of things. The What is Sex course, you got philosophical, philosophical guidance sessions, one-on-one -on -one calls with me, um, and that's, you know, when people re message me out of the blue and they say, hey, can you read my thesis and let me know what you think? Um, this is what, this is what you should be looking at. Cause I mean, obviously it takes a lot of time and energy to give somebody honest feedback on something that's complicated. So yeah, don't, if you've got a problem with exploiting workers in factories, but not a problem with exploiting me who's working right now, um, then there's a problem there. So do think about that. But if we scroll down to the bottom and you're just completely broke, you see right here, it says financial aid. You see, this, you see that there's actually, the URL is right here for financial aid. It has a person who's being barred access to a venue depicted. It's got some of the classes as posters on the window of the screen here. I'm describing it for people who don't have eyes on screen. But it says, if, is money an obstacle? Theory Underground now has a financial aid scholarship. Apply today. Um, we definitely want to make it available. And so there's a button right here. You can click it or you can just click the image and it will take you to the application for financial aid, which you can either do right here in the form. It's embedded into the page or you can click on the button. It'll take you to Google Forms and then you can do it from there. So that's the main thing that I wanted to show you is that, you know, you, I'm aware of the fact that this is impossible for some people and we're trying to make it possible. We're trying to make the impossible possible. That's the purpose of everything going on here. And so anyway, thank you all so much for watching it to the end, for uh, getting this little crash course on the website and everything from me. And just remember, if you have trouble with getting set up, you can always go to my my channel that now has 6,000 subscribers. I just broke the 6,000 subscribers threshold, so congratulations, I guess. Not that that matters because some, some channels with only 250 subscribers are better than ones with 250,000, so it's all relative. But right here, you'll see in my videos, get started with theory-underground.com, and this is where I take you through the setup process. I show you how to make your profile picture. I show you how to add a cover photo, and everything like that. So if you want the help of navigating the site, I did make a tutorial. You can find it there. But for now, everybody, 
Thank you so much for watching this. Thank you so much for all of the support um, in the comment section for the lively discourse that was going on there. Um, and I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your week. And I hope that some of you are going to sign up for this course. I know a few of you already have. And we will see you in class next week. Even though the class begins in May, we're doing some preparation stuff ahead of time. And so people who sign up in April will still have access to what's happening next week, but it will be private and then it will later be released to, um, you'll see. All right. So anyway, much love, take care, 